Howdy, and welcome to another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I'm your host, Daniel Dolphin. Our guest today is a good friend of mine and, and a guy whose art I've been following for quite a few years. He is a famed bit and spur maker, a past president of the TCAA, the Traditional Cowboy Arts Association, a true cast craftsman, artist, fellow gun connoisseur, Mr. Wilson Capert. How are you doing today? Great, Dan. Good to be here. Well, I've been looking forward to this one for a while. We've been in, in touch a little bit through the years, and uh, we hadn't met face-to-face yet, but my phone conversations with you are always pretty fun. I hope one day we get to share a glass of whiskey or rum or something like that and shoot the bull. Absolutely. I, I, uh, the world is a small place, and the phone is, is uh, certainly – and then Zoom, here we are looking at each other, never met eye-to-eye, but we can look at each other and have a great conversation. And, and uh, I, I, uh, I grew up in a very rural part of the world, where the, your closest neighbor was about six miles away. So if you got to talk to somebody, you made damn sure you were friends with them before you left. So that's that's the way I go about my day. You know? Very good. Very good. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, too, I'll plug your dad. Wilson is the son of a man that wrote a story called Murder Steer. I mean, there's really no more introduction that needs to be said <laughs> on that, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I'm not sure he wrote It's a true story. You know, oh, okay. And, yeah, it's a true story, and it had been written about uh, by uh, somebody else first. He illustrated the story is what it boiled down to. Okay. Um, but he certainly has told it, and that's a big deal there at Alpine. And, and I've heard it 13 different times, and I can't remember it, but I, I just know the steer was branded murder across it, right? It was who he belonged to, I think, and all kinds of stuff. But, yeah, Pop is an artist. He's an illustrator, and cowboy and uh quite the man I've, I've been all across the world people say man wilson caper 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 and you getting kind of my caper yep that's fun well uh, i would definitely while we're talking about that uh if y'all do instagram y'all need to follow wilson and his dad i think your dad goes by mw caper on uh on instagram but but uh definitely some cool stuff to look at through there and i'm also bothering wilson on a wednesday and he has a, a famed YouTube uh, channel where he does workshop <laughs> Wednesdays. So I feel very privileged to carve a, a chunk out of a valuable Wednesday for him. Well, I'll tell you what we might do since you bring that up is I might grab the old phone here and do workshop Wednesday and tell him exactly what I'm doing. I can plug your deal and plug my world all at the same time. So if you don't mind, we might do workshop Wednesday in the middle of this deal. Absolutely, man. You can, you can sit there and take her on something while we talk. That won't bother me. <laughs> well, we just do a short little video and say hello and then we'll go on. Cool. Um, cool. We get a break. We'll do that. Okay. Well, uh, we start everything off with the lightning round questions just to help everybody relax. Obviously you're very tense and nervous this morning. Yeah. Um, so we'll go ahead and start off. So what is your favorite way to relax? Man, I can be, uh, I can be happy wherever the heck I, I need to be. You know, my, my favorite way to relax. I mean, Let's just put it this way. At 25 years old, I left Greg Darnell to become a bit and spur. Well, not really to become a bit and spur maker. I have become a bit and spur maker since I left Greg because I've, I've never done anything else except that. And I tell everybody I retired at 25 years old. So my happy is in my shop. It really is. My happy is in my shop. I love uh, that for many, many years I wrote. That was a quick release. I love to rope. It's, I love the art of roping. It is absolutely fun. I don't get to do it much anymore. I can't rope. It's a, it's a lot of commitment. Um, I, so I always want to be the best I can possibly be, whatever I do. Roping was relaxing. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Now long range shooting is fun. Little varmint hunting is fun. Drinking a glass of whiskey with the, with the buddies on Friday night is fun too. Right. Um, so we'll just be happy wherever. Sounds way. good. Morning or evening? Are you a morning person or a night owl or, or what? I am a morning person without question. The alarm clock goes off on standard time at 3.30 in the morning and away I go. Uh, uh, I sleep in a little bit on daylight savings because I can work a little later in the, in the afternoons and still have daylight to feed my horses. So I get up at four on <laughs> daylight savings. <laughs> well, that's something. 
Yeah, I usually think of myself as a pretty early riser, but you got me beat there by a bit. Bay or Sorrel? Oh, man. I've won so damn much money. Not Let me put – much is not the right word. All the money I've won, <laughs> the most of it has been on Sorrel horses. It's probably my least favorite, but my two best horses have been Sorrel, right? So – uh, so I'm a Bay guy, <laughs> and one of the one of the most if I have a receding hairline up here, it's because of a Bay horse I own. Two of them, matter of fact. So there you go. But I like a Bay. <laughs> Does pineapple belong on pizza? Oh Lord, you're trying to get me divorced. <laughs> my wife, my, my wife, absolutely abhors pineapple. She hates it, but I can eat it on anything. But, uh, you know, let if I'm in Hawaii, I'm going to eat some pineapple on my pizza. But here in Texas, let's leave it off. How's that? I, I understand. Or just for guys' night when your wife's not around. <laughs> yeah, we'll just leave it off. We'll just... <laughs> she smell it on your But breath. I'll eat it. Yeah, but if, but if it's the only thing we got on, if it's the only pizza we got, I'm eating the hell out of it. It won't bother me a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much uh, – Marriage changes your taste in some things. Oh, yeah. Uh, a little miracle whip, but I haven't had any for 15 years. So there you go. <laughs> do you have a pet peeve? I do. I probably have lots of pet peeves. I try not to. Uh, I try not to. Well, so I'm sitting here thinking, who gets the wrath of Wilson the most, right? Who gets the... Who gets all the abuse of me? And I try not to share that with too dang many people. My poor girls, my wife and my two little girls probably get the pet peeves of Wilson the most of anybody, right? I share, I expect that more out of them, maybe. My shop is absolutely welcome to anybody in the world. Use a tool for its intended purpose and put it back. Amen. Good God, put it back. Amen. And I saw... See, yeah, that if there's one P, that's it. And in my workshops, and poor people don't have any clue where my stuff goes. I've got it scattered all over my shop. And there's one of them, usually the guy that I like the least, that has stolen everything for the first two weeks after a workshop. I've cussed him. He stole it. I knew he took it. And by the time I find it and put it back where his intended purpose was supposed to be, I have to call him and forgive him. And he didn't even know I was mad at him. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I know it. <laughs> that, that one that you're sure of so and so moved, and then you find it. That's the hardest one. It really is. Yeah. Do you have a favorite beverage? Man, a favorite beverage. Like if it's a Friday night beverage, a uh, good glass of bourbon is is a good day, right? Uh, there's two different kinds. There's quantity and there's quality. If you're starting at eight o'clock in the morning with your buddies on a Saturday, that usually comes in a plastic bottle. If it's going to be a few sips with your with your buddies in the evenings and everybody minds their manners, well, that'll there's there's several ones there, you know. It's a glass bottle for sure. Okay. Well, what do you mind uh, sharing brands? Oh. I'm, I'm kind of a whiskey and a rum guy myself. So what do you yeah, like? So Basil Hayden is good. I like the Basil Hayden. I like uh, Woodford Reserve. Maker's Mark is a constant go-to. Uh, I had some Buffalo Trace the other day. That was good. You know. Uh, I was know the bullet's good, you know. I, I've had several that are good. And sometimes I, in my TCA situations, they introduce me to stuff all the time that I can't pronounce and definitely can't afford, but it's usually really good. <laughs> yeah. My wife got me a, a bottle of Isla Scotch for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, it's Ardbeg Oogadal. And let me, like like the PD Smoky stuff, uh -huh. this is... Like, like she didn't dip the toe in the water for me. She went to the extreme end of the scale. This is, this is like kerosene with smoke in it. And yeah, I really want to like it, but I, I don't know if I'm quite man enough to like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like scotch too. I don't drink it a whole lot because most of my buddies just turn their nose. I only have one or two. My best man at my wedding, old shop, Branham, uh, mine and Katie's wedding, he, he liked it. And he's one that got me started on scotch. And he said, here, Willie, take a drink of this. And I took a big old pull off of this styrofoam cup of crushed ice. And, Man, that's good. What is that? And he said, that's scotch. I said, no, 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 I don't like scotch. That's, I had that 10 years ago, and I know that's terrible. I've been drinking a little of it ever since. Mm -hmm. I like it. Would you tell us something unexpected about you? So here you are, 
country boy from the, the hill country of Texas, bitten spur maker. What will we not see coming about Wilson Caper? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm an open book. So to say something that you don't expect, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I uh, the type of individual I am, let me, let me blab, blab here a minute and try to figure something out and, and I'll tell you stuff. But I, so I, I do announcements at church and uh, I'm a spiritual guy. I mean, I, that's not unexpected. Um, people are or not, but I, I'll do announcements at church and, and uh, I don't mind telling those folks exactly what I did the night before. And I might have a headache right now while we're doing announcements right so i'm an open book i don't i gotta be myself right i i, I don't want to create any expectations uh, about what i'm not uh jesus did uh, not turn wine in, or water into sweet tea did he so i mean hey <laughs> yeah that's right but you know i i live a so if you're going to stereotype me as a craftsman and a cowboy and, and some things like that uh artist uh the stereotype of of us guys is we live 365 days out of the 360 days out of the year in solitary confinement right uh and then when you throw us out there in public uh you expect us to act normal that's extremely difficult <laughs> Uh, it's extremely difficult for lots of us. I don't fit that mold at all. Uh, as y'all can probably already tell here, I don't mind talking. And, and uh, we all handle nerves a little bit differently, um, how we handle difficult situations. Mine is to talk my way through, right? Is, is, uh, I may get nervous and carry on, but I'm going to talk and I'm going to try to do everything I can to make that fella like me as soon as I possibly can. So that then we can be relaxed and go on and have a good conversation and, and get past the nerves. And, and uh, that is unexpected to me. I, I, um, uh, I'm a contemporary guy that, man, I'll, I don't know, maybe you think I'm a dumb old cowboy, but I, I, I try to stretch my mindset all the time type of thing. You know, education wise, I'll use technology. Try not to be fearful. I'm scared of my own shadow, but I try not to show it. Would you just, this is off of my questions, but would you class yourself more as an introvert or an extrovert? Nah, I'm happy doing both. Okay. I, I'll, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm kind of like you. I, I can could, I could talk to people and, and I can go to shows and stuff and be around people for five or six days or, or whatever. But that day off driving back home, like, I don't want to hear the sound of a human voice. You know, I, I want, I got to recharge and, and uh, nobody talk to me and, I may listen to the song, the podcast or radio or, or whatever, but I don't want to have a conversation on that day. I kind of have to recoup, you know, are I'm you gonna, like I, that or? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I absolutely like that is a, a TCA show. Um, end of April, I was, I was in Phoenix for the art of the cowgirl doing the dog and pony show in front of a booth. You're high energy from one person to the next. Everybody that comes by the booth, you want to talk to them and, and be high energy and glad you see them. I spent six days there doing that. It, that 13 hour or 11, it was 12 hour, 11 hour trip home was not a bad thing at all. <laughs> it was just me and that highway, right? And, and I did have to talk on the phone and give the progress report to everybody that was curious whether I survived the, the ladies at the cowgirl event. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's all fine by myself. <laughs> I, I know just what you mean. Um, okay, taking a sharp right turn. If mm. you could have any superpower, what superpower would you choose? I would extend the day's hours. Oh, man. I'm right there with you. I've been praying for a 36-hour day for years, probably I, 20 years. That's that's one of the things I, I pray for every night. Every, every, if I, if, if that's, that's honest, the truth, and, and I want to do all these things, and, and uh, it, it takes a huge amount of commitment of time to do it, and, and to be able to have your cake and eat it, too, is, it's really impossible. You know, and, and you have to make choices and sometimes that's tough. And, and the time is the absolute most valuable commodity I have. So if I could make more of it, that'd be a good thing. Amen. Thoughts or feelings? So you're more an intuitive type or more an analytical, logical type? And I guess as an artist, you're going to be a big blabber and feeling kind of a person, right? <laughs> <Or no? laughs> 
I'll analyze. And if anybody's ever met my dad, we philosophize now. Good gosh, almighty, we'll get on the thing and get a thinking. And so thoughts or feelings. I certainly have feelings. Certainly don't want to hurt other people's feelings. And if I feel like I have uh, uh, done that, then, then that hurts my feelings. On the other side of the coin with that is I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to talk out of both sides of my mouth because there are certain things that I believe in, and especially with this bit and spur world that I live in of, of a business side of it, not necessarily the function. I'm not, I'm not, a, which I know you are, a, 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 that's, that's your deal. And I'm sure we'll go there, but uh, I try not to push those feelings over on people because I got to let people have their own spot. And, but when it comes to, me running a business and making a living off of my hands, I've been through a wide spectrum of trials and errors and failures. And, uh, and, and I did not have a lot of examples of success out there to, to follow. So in a custom world type of thing. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I think about that. And so I don't really care about your feelings in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll step on them, but, but, but uh, as far as thoughts, I, and man, I've had people say, how do you hell do you come up with those responses so quick? Well, because I'm in here by myself for 40 hours a week or 80 hours a week thinking about something stupid somebody's going to say to me. And what am I going to respond back to them and hope it's not as equally stupid? Right. So I don't know if I think or feel, but I feel my thoughts. How's that? <laughs> man. It's, it's it's like it's coming right out of my own head. Um, <laughs> are you decisive or indecisive? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I uh, once I get something on my on my brain, by golly, I'm gonna go at it until I fail. Right. Mm -hmm. So so I'll try to think about some things, and uh, there's some business adventures that are going on with me right now that. Uh, kind of side hustle type situations it's not gonna it's gonna interfere with my custom world because that time thing right but but uh there will be no confusion as to what wilson capern stands for and what i'm doing on my, with my own mark and my own hands but but uh there's been some thoughts of of how to make money and how to make a living daniel that oh man it's been very indecisive yeah I was, but, uh, that's Wilson's talking right now about his uh, new line of men's lingerie. We'll yeah, that's that right. Later on. <laughs> that's right. I won't be modeling it either. Just need to know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's, it's, but once I make that decision, then I'm in. Let's do it. Right. Yep. Let's go. I, I, I'm a research person. I tend to think about things for a good long while, but but uh, once I feel like I've I've got the whole puzzle in front of me, and now I see what I need to see. Then I'm I'm ready to pull the trigger. So. Buying buying things is like buying things tools from my shop. Man, I can be I just man. I go forever without buying it. I want a I want a fifteen thousand dollar power hammer so bad to make you. I mean, you can taste it. I want it. Like I need it. I really need it. <laughs> right? It's not going to make me any money. So I had to thought of buying a. $30,000 laser the other day didn't scare me a bit. I was fixing to roll with it. Now, some things have changed and we don't need to get all into that. But I was going to drop $30,000 on a, on a laser, no problem, because it's going to make me money. I was, uh, you know, from is a side hustle type situation with, with parts and things and not necessarily directly with my bits and spurs, but with some other things. And, uh, yeah, I'll do that. And then, but that hammer, oh man, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make me any money because it takes me in my hands that to be running it. And it would it save me time? I tell you, occasionally, yeah, but man, it's hard for me to. It's like, nah, I don't need it yet. Yeah, so I need it, but I don't need it. <laughs> uh, well, that leads us into the next one. Do you have a favorite piece of tack or tool? I love hammers. Okay. I love hammers. I don't have a lot of them. I love handmade hammers, and I got two or three. They're really cool. Engraving blocks are really cool. In my shop, I could collect engraving blocks, vices, ball vices. And now the least expensive one that I have is the one that I use because of the microscope and different things that have, that have happened. But, but uh, that's, that's yeah, th those are two things that are really cool to me. As far as tack, uh, let's just say bits. 
Uh, just keep it general, man. Uh, uh, the, the, if I have to be specific about a certain style, the Santa Susana is my favorite style. But I love bridal bits, man. They're they're the funnest thing ever. Maybe that's why we've connected so good. But but uh, it is this. There's so much going on with those guys that it's a blast for me. Yeah. If I ever win the lottery, you're you're good to go. You're you're gonna be my <laughs> kept man for the rest of your life. We're just gonna wait. throw some uh, designs on the board, and we're we're just gonna make bits forever. That's one good. man. One man can make my career, and that spot is currently open. Right? So, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Wilson has a dad, but he is accepting of a daddy. So, anybody? Else? Yes. I'd be <laughs> good, baby. Do you have a favorite book or movie? Oh, uh, you know what? I gotta say, I gotta say, my favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is this fits that unexpected category probably. <laughs> okay. I mean, of course we love John Wayne, right? Grew up with John Wayne. I love God, John Wayne, and American Way of Life, right? Forrest Gump. Okay. The best movie in the whole wide world from a message standpoint. And I feel a lot like Forrest Gump in my life. I did not leave Greg Garnell to become a bit and spur maker. I had a couple months worth of orders. I wasn't going to be a bit and spur maker. Who in the hell could make a living doing that? Um, uh, but, but like old Forrest, I just felt like running and I, and I just took what was in front of me and somebody said, invest in that fruit company, Apple. And you know what? Away went. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I kind of, I just, I'm, I'm following God's plan. I have no idea what it is. I ask him constantly what in the world's going on. Am I doing the right thing? But, but I feel like old Forrest just kind of followed the tip of his nose and did what he said and was true to his word. And, uh, man, that, that, in a simple way, that's 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 very inspirational for me. Of course, you know, David Duvall and all of his movies, you know, I, the Lonesome Dove, all that stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big movie guy. How's that? I don't. I don't, like I don't know if I've said this publicly, but but for me, favorite movie, The Princess Bride. <laughs> Princess Bride. <laughs> Are you familiar with it? No, uh, I've heard of it, but I can't recall it. Oh man, it, it's got all, it's just one liner after one liner. The whole uh, yeah. my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die and consume. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've, I've probably seen that movie seventy five times. I, I <laughs> yeah. go end to end. So anyway, yeah, cool. Uh, do you have a guilty pleasure? Doesn't sound like you're a real guilty guy, but you know anything out there that you you got to have a Mountain Dew at ten fifteen every morning or anything like that. Oh, no, not really. I mean, man, if my wife would let me eat more ice cream, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I got a sweet tooth about me and all that. But, oh, as far as guilty pleasures, uh, uh, you know, leaving that shop, leaving the shop can create guilt. And, the, you know, back to the roping days was, was definitely a lot of fun. I loved it to death. And that was definitely a pleasure. But I did feel guilty because of the sacrifice it took the old bit and spur shop yeah i know what you mean by guilty pleasure or something that i do but no i don't i can't think about it. i'll probably think about it 30 minutes into this conversation i'll tell you what so. well, no big deal what's your favorite dinosaur <laughs> armadillo <laughs> no, I, like I don't know i didn't i wasn't a dinosaur kid right uh i was a legos guy but i didn't have no dinosaurs and uh so I don't know the Tyrannosaurus Rex. That's the only one I remember. And that's the little dude with short arms. Yeah, the small arms. Yeah. <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> Whatever. Well, like you said, the armadillo. My, mine is probably an alligator. We got them, you know, all over the place down here where I'm at. And people yeah. don't people think of dinosaurs as being extinct, but we got shark, turtle, dinosaurs. There, there's there are, uh, alligators, and there are there are those that survived. You know, uh, the antelope. Has the antelope been around since some things? It ain't got no shells on it, but. I'm not sure. Pronghorn? I think the pronghorn's been here since the dinosaur type. I ain't been here forever. I know that they are, they're unique in that they are their own genus and species. They don't share a genus oh, with yeah. any other animal. So they're like a single branch of the tree with no other little branches off of it. I'm pretty sure what's going to come from the podcast so far is Wilson should stick to talking about his bits and spurs and not about dinosaurs. So, <laughs> It's just that, you know, once you're about eight or nine, no one ever asks you what your favorite dinosaur is. <laughs> I kind of think that, you know, we need to make it cool to ask an adult what's your favorite dinosaur. Uh, who knows? I, someone? Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. I got a little four year old buddy that could tell me all about it. Uh huh. I have a clue. That's the same. I have a, my nine year old. We were talking the other day, and, and uh, I think I've said this before, but anyway, did you know that the first fossils were not discovered and recognized until the 1800s? So no. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson died not knowing that dinosaurs existed. Serious? Yep. How and, they... and like uh, chronologically, the Tyrannosaurus Rex lived closer in time to man than it did like the Stegosaurus and the Brontosaurus, and some of the other dinosaurs that were, I think the T-Rex is 55 million years ago, and those were like 200 million years ago. So just some of those little things to wrap your brain around. Was your nine-year-old telling you all this? Yes. And I trust him implicitly. He's very good. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I believe him. <laughs> I promise. If those things aren't true, they should be true. You know? Absolutely. Um, it's a good story. Have you ever had a UFO encounter? You know what? I grew up pretty close to Roswell. So <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Carlsbad. So maybe. I don't know. I, I lived, you know, when we lived, first nine years of my life was north of Van Horn, 50 miles. Uh, there, there was nothing but stars out there. So there was plenty to look at. But for me, in modern, in my, in my adult life to say, uh, there was that time. No, I, I can't say. I never used drugs, so I don't have any psychedelic experiences that way either. So, <laughs> whiskey's whiskey's made some pretty bad dreams before. I had to wake up, make sure I didn't do them. But <laughs> I don't think I've had any UFO encounters. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> that's the end of it, and uh, I'm gonna award you 302 points, which is our high score thus far. You have won the grand prize, Wilson. So I've got <laughs> a, a box of bits from China that I'm going to mail to you. I can't uh, wait. I got some hanging on the wall here. <laughs> I, do you have a collection of do not use kind of bits, a, a, a warning sort of a? I've got four or five that are that are I keep around solely as an example of don't ever buy something like this. You know, you have any of that around? Well, no. And a part of, you know, like uh, this will explain a little bit about my, my openness with somebody is, is, uh, I just let people do what they do. I don't like with my bits and my, and my spurs. I mean, if you're going to be bulldogging, I'm, and somebody orders a three and a half inch shank, I'm going to tell them, man, that if you want it, okay, but that ain't going to be the greatest experience getting off your horse, you know? And, and, and as far as, as far as bridle bits and things like that, like if, if we have somebody, you know, going to do a certain thing, I, you know, that might, if you're going to get in the races and you're going to be in thoroughbred race, you want to put a spade in their mouth. I'm going to say, man, that, that's probably not the perfect bit for that. Right. But if you want it, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll let you do what you want to do. So, yeah. so, uh, the, the, the word, and I'll, I'll also tell you this too, Daniel. If somebody says, uh, "Build me your favorite bit." You're a bit maker, so you probably know what works good. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, your hands are pulling on, it, not mine. So let's build your favorite bit. You've mentioned Greg Darnell a couple times, and all. Would you mind giving us kind of the thirty thousand foot view of? We got a fifteen year old Wilson who who grows up to a a 30 something or, or early forties, Wilson, what, what, tell us the path. What, what, how did it all come about for you? How'd we get there with Greg? Trappings of Texas started in, in Alpine, Texas, um, early eighties. I don't know the exact date, 80, mid eighties, early to mid eighties. Uh, my dad and Greg both were invited to that first Trappings. Gary Donchie, the owner of Big Ben Saddlery, I believe is the man that introduced the two of them. And and within within 35 seconds, they were very close friends. My dad's opening comment to Greg was, "That's a that's a that's a really nice bit there, Greg. Uh, I, I, the artwork is incredible. Why don't you weld the damn thing together so that we could actually use it though? Because it was a loose jaw shank. <laughs> so that kicked off their friendship. <laughs> and I, I, me and my dad don't share bit taste, right? But again, he's the one pulling on it. I'll build what the hell he wants, right? So, <laughs> so whatever. But uh, so that started off a friendship with those two. I'm in, uh, I'm in late grade school, junior high, 
when all this is going down, Greg would come down every year, spend some time uh, with my dad during the trappings and drink lots of lots of Crown Royal, get the purple bag flu the next morning and all that stuff, you know, and had they had big fun. Greg has a son that's six months older than me, Sean, who's a successful horseman, um, roper and all that, and done done big things in the, in the horse show world and, and the training world. And anyhow, me and Sean became friends once we met pretty quickly and, and, and shared a lot of good times together. I was going to school, had come home for, had come home for spring break and, and my dad was running a ranch working and, and this is no jit how it all fell down. We're sitting at a picnic table, eating lunch outside and, and Greg and my dad were talking and, and pop said, Hey Greg, he said, what if we send Wilson down there this summer to uh, work with you? He said, I'll pay him. He said, y'all don't have to worry about paying him. Just, just share horsemanship with him and, and put him to work. He said, I'll pay him. Just let him live there. Ian said crap to me. I already had plans of going building fence with a buddy and rodeo and, and all this stuff. And I looked over at him and I was like, and I looked at Greg and Greg was like, hell yeah, bring him on, do it. And I thought, well, I think I just got bamboozled, but this could be fun. Right. So, so away I went. And at the end of that summer, uh, Sean and I would get up in the mornings, ride Colts until lunch, go to town, eat lunch, come back and rope until dark, drink whiskey till midnight. It was probably beer back then, you know, but uh, drink a little beer and then have a big old time, act like 18 year old boys that we were and I start over the next day. And at the end of that summer, uh, Greg and Claudia, uh, that was his wife at that time, asked me if I wanted to move in with them. And if there's one thing about me, uh, maybe indecisive, the indecisive part, I kind of, I, I kind of needed to feel it out a little bit. I wanted to, but I had my heart going back to Tarleton. I was going to school at Tarleton, Stephenville at the time. And, and I liked that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back one more year and, and then maybe I'll move in the next summer. I spent every weekend, all the rope ends. I, I spent every time that every, every slack time that I wasn't at school at Tarleton back with the Darnells, which was a couple hour drive away. And so at the end of it, in 95, I moved in with them. Again, that, that wasn't to become a bit and spur maker. That was, that was the rodeo kid that I loved to rope and I liked to make, uh, I didn't, I, I I, I love to ride horses and I love to, and I love to rope at that point. I didn't know. I was just like forest. I'm just running, right. I was just kind of, kind of trotting along. And, uh, and even so, let's see, I lived with them for two years and Greg sold a big portion of his company. And that's when it turned into, to the Bittenspur world. And, uh, that took another year and a half of me cutting parts before it started to click. And, hey, this could be fun. And I could do this for a living. Maybe. Not well, maybe not even for a living. It's just this could be something fun for me to do. I like to make stuff, right? I love to make stuff growing up. I just didn't know what to make, and so that turned into that. And and uh, and it wasn't until six months after I left Greg that I decided or realized, hey, I might be able to be a bit sperm maker. But that's the thirty thousand foot view of Greg. Uh, that's Dad number two, and his family was very is very special to me. Uh, none of us talk very much anymore. Uh, it, it's not it's not one of those things where we talk once a week, once a year. I haven't talked to Sean in probably, I don't know, five or ten years. But I bet you if we got together today, we could have just as much fun today as we did the day we parted ways, right? Yeah. Uh, and there, was no, there was no harsh words leaving the Darnell family. It's, kid, good luck. I hope it works out for you. I love you. Call me if you need me, right? And, yeah. and that's the way it was with all of us. What about uh, when you did formally start your own business? Where where are you located at? It and what you, you keep saying custom bits and spurs. What exactly does that make? And and I guess the TCAA and and I'll give us that that portion of it. Well, we'll 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 be done at five o'clock if you want me to answer all those questions thoroughly. But, but uh, so I, I left I left Greg. Um, my mom and dad lived on the ranch that I was born on. That, or they lived on when I was born um, is it's north of Van Horn, Texas at the base of the Guadalupe mountains. And uh, it's in the absolute middle of nowhere. It's 50 miles to Van Horn, 36 miles to Dell city, which is a little farming community that barely has a grocery store. And uh, El Paso is a hundred miles away. Carlsbad was 76, 72 miles away. It's in the middle of nowhere. 
my dad managed that ranch. There was, it was the first place in Texas that they put wind turbines on. It was also one of two places in the world that had exposed deep sea marine deposits. You can't imagine how many damn people were in the absolute middle of nowhere on that ranch because we had wind geologists, wind, not geologists, wind technicians that came from all over the world putting up these wind turbines. And so there was a constant flow of people there that these geologists, Exxon had big research teams and the Colorado School of Mines and all this stuff with people from all over, all over the world coming to see these deep sea marine deposits. My mom cooked for them. There's no motels, right? It's 50 miles to Van Horn. That's the closest motel. Mm -hmm. So we had big bunkhouse type setting situation and my mom would feed feed them all so uh it was just people everywhere and the custom bit and spur world evolved and and the art side of the bits and spurs always interested me um i got started i got started with the passion started with engraving i love to engrave man and not just Wow, that was fun. And I honestly thought that I would probably have to go to the firearms engraving market to to realize uh, monetarily a living, right? Is my the, the style of work that I wanted to do that interested me, let me put it that way, that, that got my fancy. Um, the, the Western culture didn't pay for it. So I really thought I'd be engraving to be honest. Six months after living there with with my dad, mom and dad on that ranch, in the middle of where engaged, mind you, to my, to my first wife, and uh, uh, we were engaged living with my mom and dad. Pop said, "Son, you getting lots of orders?" I like, popped it running out my dad gummy ears, and uh, he and I was helping him half a day and then working in the shop half a day. He said, "Maybe you ought to go full time just making those bits and spurs." And I said, "Well, you don't need me." He said, "I got the ranch. It's no problem." go at it so away i went and and i never caught up that created the custom world right <laughs> i've never caught up so a year two years after living with them mind you i've been married a year now living at one end of the house i said pop i gotta go he said why where are you gonna go i said i'm married i can't live with you the rest of my life and he said well where are you gonna go i was like i don't know i'm not gonna go any further than i have to east so moved to Midland. <laughs> didn't know anybody west, but I didn't want to go east. I didn't want to go too far east. So we went to Midland, and uh, and that's where the custom world started. The Traditional Cowboy Arts Association started in 1998. Their first show was in '99. So we all got we all got started about the same time. The Traditional Cowboy Arts Association, the group itself, and and myself, we all kind of got knocked off their tit at the same time and away we go. I, as far, you know, like custom, what does custom mean? Custom means that I'm going to build you something. I'm going to build your story of the West. I'm going to build your function. Uh, I'm going to start out baking the cake and then we're going to put as much icing on it as you possibly want to put on there. As much as you can afford or much of your taste or whatever. The traditional Cowboy Arts Association was the third silver spoon shoved down my mouth. I was a spoiled rich kid in that I had my dad, who's the artist design aspect of my craft. And then I had Greg Garnell, who's the, the mechanical function side. And, and those two guys funnel me down the path. 2003, I moved to Midland in 2001, um, scared to death whether it's gonna make it. Now I got a mortgage, I got electric bill, I got grocery bill, feed bill. You know, I had all this stuff that mommy and daddy were doing when I was living with them, right? And uh, and so when I bought the house in Midland in 2001, we're rocking and rolling, and and when we're making it, right? I'm I'm charging about eh, maybe fifteen dollars an hour at that point. We're making a killing, right? <laughs> and uh, and we're we're doing good, and uh, and and the TCA was going. I had actually heard of them. I'd seen a. a uh, article in Western Horseman in 2001. Traditional Cowboy Arts Association did not register with me, but John Ennis, Ernie Marsh definitely did, and and uh, Mark Gall, and, and and the style that I saw on their bits and spurs all of a sudden was all that love that I had in the Western and the European firearms engraving, American firearms engraving. I should just say firearms in general, the reliefs and the gold inlays and 
Oh, I was like, holy cow. So those guys registered with me, man. I knew I was like, well, obviously I'm not going to be the first to put some of that relief engraving on there, but, but man, that's awesome. And then the price tags that them guys had on there, well, that certainly caught my attention as well, right? 15,000 for a bit. And I'm like, wow, they're rich. They're rich. You know, <laughs> so, so that's where we want to go. 2003 phone rings. It's my good buddy, Leland Hensley. He's a raw hybrider member of the TCA. I didn't know he was a member of the TCA. I didn't know nothing about it. He calls, Hey Willie, we got this deal up in Oklahoma city. You need to come to it. Oh, cool. What is it? And he said, we got a bit workshop and uh, I want you to come up here and, and uh, it cost X amount of dollars. And I think you ought to come. I was like, well, all right. And, 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 and hopefully today I'm still a baby, baby bird with a mouth wide open, trying to learn. Right. I, I, I want to stay open-minded about, baking the cake or putting the icing on is to make sure that we're, we're living and learning. But I can promise you at that point, it was wide open. So away I went, that was my introduction to the TCA. And that was my introduction to not my introduction. Greg had certainly introduced me to custom one of a kind pieces. Um, he didn't get to do a lot of them, but, but he certainly had those orders in the custom non catalog situation done for you he probably did a half a dozen of them in the five years I lived there. So I, I certainly got exposed to it there, but when I got exposed to what was going on at the TCA, man, it was incredible, right? It was, it was, it was a, a fresh paint can. Let's put it that way. And, and so it was extremely exciting for me at that point. So 2003, I said, I, and, and I went up there, Daniel, thinking I was rodeo guy at that time. I was pro rodeo. And no, no one pro rodeo at that point yet. But I was roping with Shop Branham every day at his house. I had been I'd been an open roper for for some time, and I had been exposed to the elites of my team roping world. Right? Um, I'm not going to say I became friends with them yet because <laughs> they're a little hard to get to know. A little hard to a little hard to get that door in there in in open get get an open door. Sean had been in the finals twice, so maybe he's elite, right? I mean, I hung around some of them, but. Anyhow, I went to the TCA fully believing that these bunch of assholes were just going to be good old team ropers that wouldn't give me a time a day. But you know what? I'm used to that. I'm going to go in and I'm going to worm my way into being their friend and and uh, and see what I can't learn from them. I couldn't have been more wrong. They were the they were the most welcoming, open armed, inviting individuals I'd ever been around. They. My, I said my my mouth was open like a baby bird. Well, they pulled it open wider and gave me some more, right? And it was awesome. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, but I wanted to be a part of that group. I honestly didn't have a clue what the group stood for. I didn't know what its mission statement was. I didn't know what a mission statement was, period, much less what theirs was. I just, I it was positive energy, man. I wanted to be around them, and I wanted to be around those guys. And so I applied in 2004. And, and, and I got in, it was one of the most nerve wracking, scariest experiences I'd ever been through because you're sticking your neck out on the chopping block, right? Here, here, here's my neck. Here it is. Whack it with that ax, right? Do what you want. And, and, uh, and I survived it. And, and then the work and the fear and the uncertainty truly started after that. That that's, you get you get to become friends with some of the best in the world and you realize how much further you truly have to go in your craft and uh, <clears throat> when you when you get to become friends with John Ennis who that's an individual I didn't yeah yeah I did I talked about John John and Ernie but you you get to be friends with John Ennis and the world opens up and and you just realize how how insufficient you are is that word in, insufficient lacking you know my skill set needed to grow yeah. and 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 the custom world that that's where it started right there is is that i was at this time i was kind of learning and developing a you know trying to do business and i i talk more about business than i do the actual craft of the creation of my craft but but i was trying to learn and the custom world is so hard to figure out because guess what i want to do tomorrow something i've never done before how am i going and it's all time that's all i got is running businesses time so 
a custom bit and spur business is I'm going to put my heart and soul into your story of the West. And I'm going to try to figure out how long that's going to take and charge you accordingly. And I'm not cheap, right? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> not, well, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you talk about the business side of it. I mean, I, I feel like horse trainers kind of get this too. People do not necessarily appreciate the time that we take. And if they don't appreciate the time that we take, they definitely don't appreciate the 30 years that went into that. It only takes me this long now and, and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, I kind of feel like, well, like you, the first 10 years of that was impossible. The next 10 years of that was a little bit better. And, and now it's getting bearable. But uh, if, if people knew what some of us have gone through, they they might appreciate the time a little bit more. Um, uh -huh. Just so while we're here on the, the TCAA, I don't want people to get the impression that that's just a bit and spur organization. Mm -hmm. And I will put a link to it in the, the uh, show notes and everything. So would you tell us a little bit more about the, the TCA? Yeah. yeah, I apologize for not doing I apologize to my other 11 cronies for not uh, describing them properly as well. There's only two bit and spur makers that are active members in the group, and that's me and Ernie Marsh. We represent saddle making, silversmithing, raw hydrating, and bit and spur making. Our mission is to preserve and promote those four disciplines and the roles they, they, they represent in, in our Western culture. Our uh, purpose statement is to elevate the legacy of the West. Mass production was taking over. And two men, the, the original idea started with two men, Kerry Schwartz and Mike Beaver, their founding members. Kerry is still an active member, our secretary, treasurer of the group. You know, they were at a show and they said, man, I wish we had some place we could go show our work and, and tell people, share people what's going on and, and, and share sure quality right his mass production was taken over and people our, our makers were becoming uh, a bunch of part-timers right you couldn't make a living doing this so you had to have a job so you spent what what was left over of time and energy in the end of the day to try to learn how to make something and then you got china out there producing quality work maybe not artistic work but quality functional work could be found and uh at, at a price rate that there wasn't any way you could make a living trying to compete with them right it's to this day if you're in the production world you have to compete with good old china mm -hmm. and and so our group got together and said we're going to preserve quality and we're going to share that with anybody interested maker or collector and collectors anybody that's not making it that doesn't mean you hang it on the wall. You, you're a collector. You got a barn full of them. I'm sure that you use, right? Yeah. Um, and so it, it's it's uh we get labeled. Yeah, my, get labeled. my bit uh, collection ever gets sold after I die or something. You can rest assured there's horse saliva on every damn one of them. <laughs> oh yeah, no doubt. That's good. That's good. And it, you know, and, and in my world, in my artistic world, as I as I have in possession a $17,000 bit and $28,000 pair of spurs. Oh, you can't use that. Yes, you can. It's just, it's just, it's just pretty, right? It's just pretty. But before all that pretty happened, it's made to use. And that, that $28,000 pair of spurs I have right now, I, one side of them looks like a $500 feed store spur. And the other side looks like a $28,000 finely engraved sculpted gold inlaid treasure from of a european shotgun or something right it, was, it took two days to build a spur and three months to engrave it. that's what it boils down to yeah. um but yeah it's got to be used it doesn't have to be used that's a decision my my make my my customer my collector my user has to make um, but so back on the tca is is uh I kind of lost my train of thought, but it, it's, 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 we're, we're there to preserve that and to share that, share that quality with people and, and to, to, to try to help shine a bit of elegance on our Western culture, right? Hollywood's done a real good job of depicting an individual that is uneducated and takes a bath once a week, whether it needs to or not, right? And uh, a drunk, mind you, a, an uneducated drunk that takes a bath once a week. That's not who our West is. Can we do that? I mean, you've been there. We enjoy those times, right? Mm -hmm. um, we enjoy we en we enjoy the ruggedness of the West, but that's not all there is to the West. There's a, there's elegance to our Western culture too that was being lost. 
and 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 the sophistication, right? Uh, we're not uneducated at all. Um, you look at the 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 cattle baron movies of John Wayne McClintock. That was not a homely lean to of a house that he lived in, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a very nice establishment and and uh, he was a man of means and and he had nice china and nice silverware and, and things like that and so that's who we are and that's what we represent is, is those four little disciplines we don't represent all aspects of our western culture of, of hats and boots and you know there, there's lots of other disciplines out there that absolutely have value and a place in our western culture the tca just focuses its attention on those four and one other thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but but each of you are are sort of mentors as well. You all not only apply the craft, but you teach the craft. Is that fair well, to say? Th that, and and yeah, that's exactly right. Is is that's what we do? And I teach that craft to anybody willing to listen. Right? Is like collector or peer. So my job as a member is to build the three best things I've ever made in my entire life each and every year. So that means I got to stretch myself, right? I got to stretch myself to places it's completely uncomfortable. And then I share that knowledge gained from that experience with anybody willing to listen. And, and uh, I have workshops here in my shop. Uh, not, not all members have workshops, but I, I have six different workshops and, and, uh, and go around the country uh, sharing that knowledge with anybody that wanting to know, you know, my, my deal with Art of the Cowgirl, I mentioned it earlier. And that's to help mentor a girl in, in the art of business fur making, right? And so that's mm -hmm. non TCA. That's that's great myself, and, and we as an organization have have our little educational programs. But the individuals, I'm a 300, I'm a member 365 days out of the year. So everything that I do in my shop personally also reflects back on the TCA, positively or negatively. So if I'm a turd, it, the group looks like a turd. I hope I don't. I hope I don't do that. But but I. Yes, we as individuals for our group do an awful lot of teaching. That's very good, and I can I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, um, you know, the horsemanship's kind of the same way. I, I don't sure. go to clinics holding things back. I try to give away everything that I've ever. Not, sometimes people aren't aren't ready to hear everything I have to say, but but uh, I'm, I'm here to talk anyway. <laughs> I, I tell them this, Daniel, I will give you all of my information, absolutely give it to you and hope that you start off right where I left off, right? Is I want you to be as good as me. Come on, get better. But I'm going to charge the hell out of you for my time. <laughs> I'll give you that information, but man, that time is precious. <laughs> Listen, I think we have about come to the, the time where we need to uh, speak about our sponsor for sure. this episode. And I hope you enjoy this. I try to always find a, a sponsor that's custom to uh, the guests we're having on. So this is this is our sponsor for this episode. As we all know, guns are not your typical mechanical devices, and they can certainly go off at inopportune times, causing massively bad PR. In our modern society, important people can't possibly be expected to exercise basic firearm safety at all times like on a film set, for instance. Even those who have spent decades espousing how bad guns are are laying out true facts about how nobody needs automatic assault rifle ghost guns with 50-round clips capable of shooting 5.56 rounds per second and even hurting people's feelings just by being seen. That's why Alec Baldwin has founded the Alec Baldwin School of Firearm Safety and PR. We teach you truly important things like not placing your finger on the trigger until you're ready to fire. Who else knew that guns have to have the trigger pulled in order to go off? Not us until recently. We've even sworn under oath that guns can go off without touching the trigger, and now we're finding out that's not true. How about not pointing the muzzle at anything you aren't willing to kill or destroy? As you can tell, at the Alec Baldwin School of Firearm Safety and PR, we are on the cutting edge of firearm safety education and virtue signaling. In our advanced course, we even teach things like checking any gun that's ever handed to you to see if it's a hot weapon and what the term downrange really means. If you're an actor and guns are a factor, you need the Alec Baldwin School of Firearm Safety and PR. Don't handle your firearms carelessly like a filthy little pig. And definitely don't let your career be harmed by your total lack of understanding of things that six-year-old country kids know like the back of their hand. 
The Alec Baldwin School of Firearm Safety is here to help. We're not really sure what they are, but we're now also selling Freedom Seeds and Liberal Tears. Daniel has assured us that Freedom Seeds are in scarce supply these days, and the country needs more availability, so we're working on it. He's also told us that selling these Liberal Tears products is a great way to help grease the way and to help us all heal and ease any hangups we might have. We're not sure what level tiers are exactly, but we trust Daniel, so we've ordered a bunch. We're simply waiting on a few trucks from Canada to deliver our order. Should be here next week. All right. What do you think of that one? <laughs> That's awesome. I had, I had several long-winded stories come to mind that I could, <laughs> I could elaborate on. <laughs> the whiskey-induced stories <laughs> about... Me opening my big mouth in liberal places that I shouldn't. <laughs> well, sometimes one of my favorite jobs I've had uh, used to be heavily involved with the Boy Scouts, and I was a BB gun range master. <laughs> and you have to give the you know the little safety spiel to a different group of eight year olds every twenty minutes all yeah. day long. So I would always start off. I'm holding the BB gun up there up front, and this is my gun. There are many like it, but this one is mine. And then I would do the, the parts of the gun and, you know, this is the butt. What happens if we have a, a problem right here and something breaks? It's a butt crack. And I mean, you say butt crack to a bunch of eight-year-olds. And oh, yeah, it's on. You, yeah, <laughs> full attention from then on. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. My favorite part of each episode is thinking up who the sponsor is going to be and, and uh, writing that. So you might throw that <laughs> into Workshop Wednesdays, huh? Yeah, exactly. You know what? We ought to do workshop. Let's do workshop Wednesday right now. Do you care? Absolutely. No, jump in. Yeah, watch this. It'll just be a this just, just do a quick little. I will. Uh, I'm not going to edit this part out, but but for those of you listening to the podcast, I will put a link to his specific video in the uh, show notes so you can go watch it too. So, and, and just for y'all to know, I'll tell you a quick little story. Lorinda Van Newkirk is is uh, a lady that. She found me because of Ryan Moats had a pair of spurs. He got a pair of spurs for Christmas, and their neighbors, Lorinda and, and Ryan, are, are neighbors. And, and uh, she saw Ryan's spurs, and she sent me an email and said, I don't know who the hell you are, but I need some of your spurs, right? Basically, that's <laughs> what it boiled down to. And I said, Yes, ma'am, absolutely. She had a cute little link at the bottom of her page that said, Lorinda Van Newkirk marketing.com or something like that. And so I went to snooping to see who she was. And I was like, holy cow, I know I need this lady in my life. So anyhow, long story short, I hire her and, and uh, to do help me with some marketing and get my name known out there. And and uh, she said, you need to start doing workshop Wednesdays. No, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. How am I going to do? I'm not going to do a video. I'm not going to stare in front of a phone. And she said, she said, shut up. Just do it. And and uh, I, I never hugged her. I'd never seen her. I, I didn't know who Lo was. I just talked to her on the phone, you know. And I won my battles with her just like I went on with Katie, right? I wasn't doing nothing. So I did the Dead Gum Workshop Wednesday, and I got on iMovie, and I I edited it up a little bit. And tried to. I mean, I'm a big-time bit sperm maker, right? I'm selling high-dollar stuff. I can't be putting out trashy content, right? I got to be something special. So I edit the damn thing up. And of course, it shows up about that big on your damn phone. Little bit. He doesn't even fill the screen up. Nobody can see it. I sound like an idiot. And she, within minutes of me posting it, what are you doing? I said, I did the video just like you said. Don't yell at me. I'm very sensitive. And she said, she said, no, Wilson. She said, just do a damn video. You're a dork. Let the people know you're a dork. Embrace your dorkness. Just go. I never met her. And she's telling me this stuff. And I was like, all right. So away I went. <laughs> I've embraced my dorkness, and it doesn't bother me a bit to do workshop Wednesday. So <laughs> you seem very comfortable with it. Yeah. You so know, here we go. Look at there. Hello, hello. There's, guys, that's Daniel Dolphin. He's contacted me. Let's do it. Wait, you can't you can't see me over here on the screen. Let's do it like this. You can watch me watch you. Does that make sense, Daniel? That sounds good. <laughs> so, Daniel, actually, tell yeah. tell everybody what your podcast is and, and what we're doing. So, uh, this is adult onset horsemanship, which you can find on any podcast directory, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast. Um, I'm 
I'm a horsemanship clinician who's probably best known for talking about how bits function and so forth. And uh, Wilson and I uh, met on Tinder, and uh, you know, here we are. <laughs> so it's adult onset horsemanship. Actually, Daniel has a sense of humor, as I do too, and. Uh, we're doing. We're talking podcast today. Daniel has a has a, uh, has done some extensive research on on the function of a bridle bit. That certainly hits a soft spot in my heart. Um, and that uh, if you can't bake a cake, don't put any icing on it, right? And so, uh, me and Daniel have talked a lot. We're talking today about it. We're doing this podcast right now as we speak. And and uh, he watches workshop Wednesday. So here we are. We're doing it. And I thought I'd promote him a little bit. What's going on? While we go at it, and I'll post this here in a little while when I get done talking to Daniel. And, and uh, y'all check it out. Daniel, how are they going to find it? What's the... Uh, if you just look up adult onset horsemanship, uh, you should be able to find it there. Or you if Google dolphin horsemanship, D-A-U-P-H-I-N, uh, you can find it through my website too. So, so when, when's a when's a scheduled plan on this podcast being aired? Uh, this one will probably be out in about a week and a half. Uh, the Monday of the 21st is probably yeah. when this one goes live. So. February 21st. February 21st, this will be out. And, and uh, he promised me he's going to do some editing to make me sound better than what I do, but y'all are used to me sounding like a dork, so it's all good. We'll see y'all next week. Happy Workshop Wednesday. Adios. We did it. All right. I've been wanting to work in some unnecessarily uh, bleeps, like you said a bad word, just in the random middle of a sentence, so I might have <laughs> yeah. some of those in there for you, too. That's all good. <laughs> It's all good. So if you uh, <laughs> if you listen to either of Clinton Anderson's podcasts that he did on, the, on the Gauge, no, it's on the Gauge. Have you heard of the Gauge? I've heard of the Gauge. I haven't listened to it. Yeah, I'll check it out. <laughs> well, uh, but uh, Clinton is not bashful about his vocabulary. It doesn't offend me at all. I mean, I'm not offensive at all. But he talks about it. And, and uh, it, it's kind of funny. People, the, the first person that sent to me said, "Hey, be careful of the language." But I think you might like this. You two are kind of similar. And uh, I, I've never met Clinton, but I, <laughs> in a lot of ways, we're 180 degrees apart. In a lot of ways, we couldn't be any more similar. <laughs> and when it comes to business and being bold with your business and and uh, uh, making a living and connecting with people, he certainly. We connect in a lot of ways. I'd love to meet him one day. Maybe one day I will. I'm mentioning it now. Maybe somebody watching this knows Clinton. I'd like to meet him. It'd be fun. Huh? I'm sure y'all would get along. He's a funny guy, too. So. I never – you know him? Not well, no. Oh, uh, I, we've got – we we know some people that we have in common, I guess, yeah. that we're both pretty close to. From the sounds of it, he, he's he got his ideas, and he's pretty, he's pretty opinionated on them. But if you follow along with him, I guess you're good. If you don't, well, too bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he definitely falls into that camp. Yeah, he's yeah. he is who he is. Yeah, which is good, right? We can all get along with people like that. Yeah. Uh, I can, I view us all like different flavors of ice cream. You know, some people like yeah. chocolate, some people like vanilla, some people like Rocky Road. I mean, that, that's whatever uh, whatever you like. You know, so. I just want people to be who they are, so that they can accept me being who I am. Because I'm good with you being you, right? It don't matter. You want to pull on your horse that way, you pull on it. I'm not going to say I'm going to do it because I can't make it work, right? But yeah. what you want to do, let it roll. Well, go ahead. I interrupted you. I took no, you. Uh, well, why don't we talk about – you talked about Workshop Wednesday. Uh, so, so far we've talked about you as a bit and spur maker, but you also are a teacher of the craft. So, you want to talk a little bit about that side of things now? Sure. So, and it kind of all got started with the TCA. We were doing workshops and, and uh, you know, just sharing the skill set with what we do. It's my happy Daniel is is doing one of a kind pieces, one offs, you know, the big fancy high end twenty, thirty thousand dollar things that take me three or four months to do. That's my happy. But but I, I love people. I love sharing with people and and there's been a demand come up of hey, can you do workshops? And and honestly, the the cash flow is a little better than teaching a workshop than it is than it is making bits and spurs a lot of times um so so i i, I decided to make a little business there i have two stresses in my life cash flow and commitment so if i'm gonna <laughs> you get it <laughs> yeah. 
bulldog mouth and a chihuahua ass. Uh, sure, I'll do this for you tomorrow. And then figured out how to pay the banker and the wife is a little problems. So when I do these workshops, commitment stress goes through the roof because now I'm no longer I'm no longer doing what what I told somebody that I would do for them three years ago. So I charge extra. I, I make more doing workshops than I do making my bits and spurs. It's going to sound bad. I honestly don't care about somebody's career. I want to teach them as much as I can. I want to give them, if that's all of my knowledge, if they can take all of my knowledge in a four-day period and go home and be as good as me, that does not hurt my feelings at all. It makes me proud. It makes me happy to see somebody do that. But with the statement of, I don't care about their career, if I give them all that knowledge in a four-day span, and they go home and they never, ever, ever do another thing with it. If I truly cared about their career, that would hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt my feelings for you not to use it. You paid for my time. I gave you my knowledge. And what you do with it after that is entirely up to you. And, and if you want to get on this journey with me and, and uh, row this old boat, by golly, there's room, man. You get in with me and we'll all go down this stream the same way. And uh, I love teaching. I look at my teaching just like I look at my bits and spurs as a product. I need to be a good teacher. I need to be able to articulate. I need to be able to articulate multitude different ways to try to make it make sense with whoever it is I'm talking about. And I was the waterhead in class that they had to explain it 14 different ways before I finally got it. Right. So I always have one of those in my class that I can sympathize with, and I'm trying to do everything I can to figure out how to do it. <laughs> I, had a, I had a close friend that was in the education business, um, 70 years old, teaching in one of my engraving classes. And, and uh, the third day of us racking our brains, trying to break some old habits and go some new directions, he said, you know, Willie, you're finally teaching a little bit better today on the third day. He said, you're doing a better job. And I thought, Man, I've been trying to get into you the whole time, all the different ways. Finally, I said it some way you understand, right? <laughs> but teaching is good, man. It's, it's a good way. And, and uh, part of the marketing and branding of, uh, of what I do, this is, this is a side street. But uh, how many people do you know have ever picked up a hammer and chisel, a file, a graver, uh, and tried to make something with it, right? Um, that, not a lot of people. Everybody that, that that had to endure kindergarten got a big chief tablet and a great big pencil, and they said, draw a pretty picture and color it and tell us about your, your family vacation. Well, good gosh. We all know how hard that is to paint a pretty picture like my dad does. Right? It's like they all look at my dad's stuff and they go, wow, that's just beautiful. So so by me teaching class, I give people the experience of what it is to create the things that I create. And, and, and it gains some appreciation for it. It's like filing around. It looks easy, right? It's just two little facets that go down the center deal. It's easy. That's the most difficult thing in the world to build a pair of spurs. That's the, that's the absolute hardest part of building a pair of spurs is filing the route properly. So if I teach people and I show people what it is that I'm doing, exactly how I'm doing it, and and then they struggle with it. They can go and then tell everybody, y'all don't understand how good he's doing it. Like, holy cow, that's hard. So it's a it's a it's a word of mouth form of marketing for myself of, of my skill set of and, and that's you know, I'm not trying to be the best. I'm not uh I'm just trying to become the Mont Blanc. There's probably pins out there that write better than the Mont Blanc. But everybody thinks they're the best and they pay a lot of money for them. Well, that's what I'm trying to accomplish as a bit of sperm maker. <laughs> now, now, uh, as a little side note, so that we don't have to edit that out so that people truly understand where I am. I don't care about being the best. I care about being the best that I can be. That journey never ends and it starts every morning. So I get my butt to the shop and I go to work to be the best that I possibly can. And, uh, and, uh, and, and honestly, Daniel, most people, because of what I was telling you, don't truly appreciate or understand the skill set that I'm trying to accomplish. Right. And, yeah. and so I don't expect them to understand. Um, I don't expect I, I, for the longest time. I thought people would say, 
oh, he's really good, so we'll pay him a lot of money to do it. That ain't the case, man. That ain't how it's going to work. Uh, it's going to have to be something other than that. Now, they're not going to buy junk for a high price, so I got to be good, right? It's, you have to be good at what it is that you're doing, but that can't be the only ingredient to creating a successful business is being good at what you do. It's, yeah. just, it's just part of it. At some point, too, you get to a level where the, the only people who can tell the difference in your level of work is the other eight people in the world that are as good as you are. The rest of us are don't know what we're looking for to know the difference. I, I run into that with, with horses a lot, too. Uh, you talk about the skills. The, the first thing I do at every single clinic is get all the, the people. Usually we have about a dozen of them in a semicircle around me. And most of the time I haven't met them, don't know where they are, don't know where their horsemanship's at, you know, so. I ask them to walk forward seven steps and stop on the seventh step. Now that sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Would, would you agree? It's kind of like that. It route. sounds simple. Yeah. yeah. 12 people. Would you, would you like to know the highest number of people I've ever had that can actually walk forward seven steps and stop on the seventh step? If you've got two, I'll be impressed. It's two. Yep. Usually it's there one. There you go. is the most I've ever had that can walk forward seven steps and stop on the seven steps. So and, I, and I, caveat, not sure I could do it. Right. No. I mean, I can feel my horse's feet, but I understand exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. like, it's also a little humble pie. Sometimes you get people that come in there pretty cocky, and then I can right. remind them three hours later. How many steps did you walk forward when we were supposed to? You know, <laughs> not that I actually do that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So for your, your workshops, how many people do you take in and, and kind of what's the process? Are they drawing it out on day one? Do they leave with a finished pair of spurs or or, or what? How does it work? Uh, they, so um, spur class and bit class, one and the same, four-day steps, four-day process, spurs. Um, I cut the parts out for one spur. Oh, let me back up. I give them a choices of a half a dozen, a dozen different things they can create. I don't want anybody showing up at my house to build that bit on day one. That ain't going to work, right? Santa Barbara Spade ain't going to happen in four days or four months if I go, <laughs> right? Yeah. Is it, this, we're not, I, so I, I, I control the pie. And what do we all want to do on our first project? The greatest thing that's ever been done, right? We want to create the greatest thing that's ever been done. So I give, them, I give them parameters to go within. Now, of course, if they say, hey, dude, I, I need a, a little longer shank, a little bigger rail, a little whatever, right, is that, is that I'll deviate and, and uh, adjust to their exact desires. But that's not, that's not truly the purpose of my class there. The, the purpose is to create the mechanical skills to create a pair of spurs. So I give them choices. I get parts cut out for one spur. Not two, not a pair, just one. And, and we start on day one building it. It's going to take us all the two days to build that one spur. They're going to mess up. I'm hands on. I'm, I'm in the middle of everything. Okay, this is how you do this step. This is how you do. I'm teaching all the way through the whole process. Going from one, uh, I'll have, uh, from, I need four people to have a class. I'll have four to eight people in a, in a spur shop. Uh, I don't need eight. So but I have had it sometimes. It's, it's a lot of people in there. We all hang up at the grinders, at the, at the belt sander. And I, I got four grinders, but it's still, we hang up there. So we build that one, that one spur. I'm hands-on involved. Day one's a son of a bitch. Day two's a little easier. By day four, I'm hollering, hey, y'all remember me? This is my shop. I live here too. Y'all need me, right? But that's, that's what I'm looking for, is by that day four, they don't need me. They know the stages. So by building two separate spurs, it's kind of like building two pair of spurs because on day three, when we start the next spur, I make them cut out all the parts. They got to run the bandsaw. They got to do all their own. They got to make their own mess at this point. And everybody thinks that the bandsaw is, is a, or a water jet or laser is cheating. Well, no, it's, it's, it's not. I mean, it's just technology, but anyhow, you, you learn how to, to use those tools and create a quality part and then go at it. And then I'll say, okay, you remember how we did this? And they're like, no. And I'll, I'll show them the, the jig or what. Oh, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it. So the way we go. So it spurs memory, away they go. 
And we end up with a finished cake at the end of four days. Everybody's built a, a pair of spurs. Now I've had people stay supposed to end at five o'clock and I've had some had to watch me drink whiskey while they, <laughs> while they finished up their deal. Cause it's, it's Friday, it's Friday, man. We're going to have a little whiskey and five o'clock. I'm done. Y'all want to keep building spurs and finish your project. Fine. But I ain't helping no more. <laughs> no, I'll help. I'm there. Um, bit class is, is a similar situation. Well, uh, we'll, we'll cut out one shank. We'll do the, we'll bake the cake, build a mouthpiece, do the second shank and put them together. Bit class usually goes faster than spurs. Doesn't take quite as long depending on what's going on. Uh, spurs are a pain in the ass. I would have thought they were a little simpler, but I guess the hanger situation, it can get tricky right there. And then the row, like you say, they are easier. The pain in the ass of them is, is there's, there's, there's two of them. So that means you got four sides and it's like, you know, you're, it seems like you're doing the same thing over and over and over again on a pair of spurs where a bit, you got two outsides and two insides, which still four sides. Right. But it, it's a lot easier on a bit. usually. Do you ever use like scales to make sure that like this shank and this shank are, are the same weight or anything like that? Or I, on my own personal, no, I've never done that. Um, Greg didn't do that. I didn't do that. Now, I will say that that probably ought to be something on some people, you know, uh, they ought to think about it. So when I designed my silver, when I designed my bit, I designed the silver at the same time. So that means I don't need to be redesigning the architecture of the bit while I'm making it because I've already got my silver designed to fit certain areas. And that, and the boundaries on those is 50 thousandths of an inch. So doesn't take much deviation to screw up that border and borders are extremely important to me in design. So they're, they're not going to weigh that much differently. If I execute my deal properly, they, yeah. I'm not going to say they weigh exact, but I, I bet they don't weigh more than an ounce. If any. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that can be a weird thing. I remember one of the trainers I worked for, he had, Two bits. I'm not going to, they were just production type bits, probably made in China or whatever. Identical, same model, same this, that, and other. One of those damn things rode a lot better than the other one. Uh -huh. They were on different types of head stalls, so you could tell which was the good one and which was not. And it was a fight. Anytime more of one of us needed that thing, it was like a who could slip into the tack room and grab that bridle first. Cause I don't know why it was. I mean, you couldn't <laughs> easily look at them and tell any difference, but they damn sure rode different. And you um, couldn't, I mean, you couldn't tell, was it in the mouthpiece? I don't know. I mean, it was a little short shank, uh, single jointed uh, bit was what it was. And I mean, again, visually, we couldn't look at them. Now I say that, like, maybe now I could look yeah. at it, you know, 25 years later and I could see what the, the change was. But at that point, none of us could. And, uh, but, but we all could tell they rode different. Now, I, I do think probably, you know, you may have to be in a fairly small group of, percentage wise of riders to, to have noticed the difference but when you get well, in that group the little differences become bigger you know so i am um, i built a bit for my buddy shot brand on the other day shot trains horses for a living and uh i shouldn't say the other day i've been building several bits for him over the last 20 years and and uh, he has a particular mouthpiece i call it the baskins mouthpiece it's kind of one that stemmed from don baskins that what i create now doesn't look anything like what don recently came up with, but I still give them the name, right? Give them the credit for coming up with it. But anyhow, I built a bit for him, same damn mouthpiece. I, I, there was three bits. They're supposed to be the exact the same. Well, through time and horse training and wrecks and colts and all the different things, the rings had bent and everything was also the, the ratios of the, of the shanks had changed a little bit and there was a particular difference between the old original that he loved and, and one that was uh, the middle one that wasn't quite strong enough. I'd been, I, I'd made it out of material where it bent and carried on. Those two rode exactly the same to him. He told me that the shape, the rings were completely different. The ratios were no longer, but he said they ride the same. He liked it. Mm -hmm. And then I had this other one that the rings weren't bent on. It matched exactly to the original. That didn't ride anywhere close to the same. Mm -hmm. I'm like, shot. If those two are the ones that ride the same, you got them confused, right? And he's like, no, Willie, it doesn't. It's totally different. So I got to evaluate what was going on. So the mouthpiece is all hand forged. It's done on the anvil. No 
And so there's small deviations from one to the next as you go along. Well, the, the port is tapered, spooned out on the back of it. It's spooned out. Well, when I spooned it out, I brought that, I brought that taper down into the, to the curve, the juncture where the bars and the port meet. And I'd create a bit of a, let's call it the set. If you take a cross section of it, it was more oval than it was round. Mm -hmm. So when the bit engaged and rolled, the surface area changed from big to little. It didn't stay consistent. It wasn't round right there. So the oval, the, the point of the oval came down. That's my theory of what was going on. And that's, a, that's right. The pressure of the bar is right. And that's a big high point on, on the pressure of the bit. And, and I thought that's got to be it. If the other two ride the same and the shanks aren't anywhere close to being the same for, for measurement purposes, um, it's got to be something with that mouthpiece, that, that the way it rotated and, and how it engaged in the bars of the mouth. Is what did it. it but it does man it took me a while to find it right and playing with it and, and that's my theory at the moment I, i'll believe it until i'm proved otherwise which uh -huh. could be. Yeah. that sounds good so is that i know i've commented on on one of your mouthpieces before that that you sort of have a cup in the port yeah, that's on the it. back side that's the basket mouthpiece that's okay. the basket's mouthpiece yeah like so it's just part. like a regular medium port but then you spoon out the back of it cup it out so when it sits on the on the tongue of the horse you know it's 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 there's more space for the tongue to go in there, right? It, it, when it, when it's non-engaged, then it fits on the tongue better. That's kind of, it, it's, and you can put it in a young horse's mouth that's never had a solid mouthpiece and they, they'll lip it for a minute and then they just kind of suck it in until it just fits on their tongue. They're like, cool. Way we go. I like, I like that design idea a lot. I didn't realize that wasn't original to you, but, uh, no, and I no. like that you, you're keeping that one of my particular sacred cows. I, I don't know why it is. I've never met Mr. Billy Allen. I, I don't have any friends in common with him or whatever, but I sure love the mouthpiece that he designed. And it sure. pisses me off to no end when companies steal that design and call it something else. That just, okay. that really chaps my ass. Uh, so, <laughs> so are you talking about the mouthpiece that, that straight bars with a roller in the middle? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the bars kind of wiggle to a point. Yeah, but it kind of limits. The, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So that, that was the Billy Allen. That's what Greg called it. So you you got to like Greg, right? He, he called it the Billy Allen mouthpiece. Yeah, I think they designed it together. Billy Allen was a reigning horse trainer back in yep. the 60s and 70s. And and uh, and he, you know, I guess got together maybe with Greg, maybe with somebody else and, and came up with that design. And it is, it's a, a, a damn good one. You know, it's it's got its place in there. It's very handy. And, and if a guy comes up with something like that, I think he ought to, uh, 300 years from now, that ought to be called the Billy Owl, you know, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. So exactly right. I, I name all my shanks after the people that, that, that they're made for, right? If it, if it's, if it's a new design, which I'll do repeats, but if there's a new design specifically for somebody, yeah, I build you something one day and you're going to have certain design and parameters and all that. That's going to be the Daniel Dolphin design. Daniel right. Dolphin. Shank, right? so. Absolutely. You, how about we call it the, the, the uh the asshole how about we'll go <laughs> no, you, i'll show you an asshole and you're not that <laughs> i got some it, it I depends. you were talking about offending people earlier i i have that problem sometimes i offend people and and, and like you it makes me feel bad when it happens but i always tell them this I say, if i ever intend to offend you you will have no doubt that that was, <laughs> that was right. going. Yeah. i'm not passive aggressive i mean if we cross ways you will have no doubt that that's what's going on with that moment. <laughs> on, that, on, that, on that Clinton Anderson podcast, he tells a story about it. There's always that lady that he can't do business with, and she's a pain in his ass, and he does everything he can to be as tactful as he possibly can, that I just can't do business with you. And finally, she says, but why? And she's painting him in the corner of why he can't do business with because you are fucking crazy, and I can't live with that. <laughs> it takes way too much of my energy to not hurt your feelings every time i talk to you <laughs> so i just i just i just said the big bad word i shouldn't have said it there you go right i was just repeating daniel i mean uh, clinton, yeah. clinton yeah <laughs> it's adult onset horsemanship so we go. keep all that out there <laughs> all right well which would you rather build bits or spurs do bits. you have a Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, you ever build snaffles or it's just bridle bits for you? Oh, no. It, it, if it goes in the horse's mouth, I call that a bit. So, you know, if they want a snaffle, I'll build a snaffle. I, I don't, do, I mean, 
And so time and materials, right? Uh, if you want to ring Snaffle, call Greg, call, call Troy Clayhardy, call Matt Humphreys, you know, call Josh Owenby. That, that may, I shouldn't say Josh, but people that have a production line, you know, stuff out there, then, then go get one of those uh, probably. If you want to make a ring Snaffle or a D Snaffle that's extremely pretty and all that, I'll do it. Built a $6,000 one this, this last year. Uh, it was cool, right? Mm -hmm. It had some sculpted gold on it and all kinds of cool stuff. So, yeah, I built a snaffle, but probably not a $50 one. Yeah, yeah I can understand. One of my hobbies, um, I don't think I've talked about on here, but I like to build knives. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and kind of like you, I mean, I, I don't really do that for a living. It, it's more of a hobby. I, I give a lot of them away. But when I go into tractor supply and I see a $30 case knife that's got three blades on it in the case, I'm just sitting there going, how in the hell did they build that and sell it for 30 bucks? I mean, that would take me 19 hours, you know? I mean, there's no way I could do that. But, Technology. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I worked for Greg, we built 1,500 bits and spurs a month. I know how to make them fast. Don't like to make them fast. So just a different deal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're you're solely in the camp of being an artist at this point, I, I think. And I do hope people are using your gear. I, like I say, I would yeah. I would really find it a shame to, to see some of those those bits never actually go in the horse's mouth. And yeah. I appreciate the the eye you have for function. That I was the reason we met was because of that bits and bidding video that I was doing and, and I was trying to approach a few different bit makers, but, but I was trying to approach the right bit makers, um, sure. you know, because you, you, I look at, I look at things a little different than a lot of people do. And, and there are some people that build stuff that I just kind of look at and shake my head and just, you know, it's almost like it was built on a, a dare or, yeah. uh, or something like yeah. that. I've always appreciated not only your craftsmanship and your art. I'm not so big in all that engraving frou frou crap, you know. But I mean, if, if you got to have an umbrella pineapple drink, then I mean, hey, that's your. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm an umbrella pineapple bit maker. <laughs> no. Um, well, you I'm know, but no, it's it's the truth, and and honestly, Daniel, that that all bit and spur makers, those of y'all that are listening, are bit and spur makers. There's no sense in putting that icing on the cake unless it works. Now, I mean, it's it. Do do you? You don't need a cake just because it's pretty, right? Yeah. So that bit needs to work. Now, that, now that's a big, broad spectrum right there. What works for you may not work for the next guy that comes in here, right? And 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 I have as a so as a bit maker, it's my job to fulfill the desires of that individual person. And, and I have, I have people come in here and tell me, well, I'm, I'm trying to save the horse. I'd never do anything like that. Cause it, because that just kill a horse's mouth. Well, no, it might not. I mean, the hands that are pulling on is what hurt the horse. Just like you're just like the finger pulling the trigger on a gun. Yeah. The gun right. didn't hurt the gun. The gun created the bullet, but the fingers what created the problem. Yeah. And, and Plus, the mouthpiece wrapped with barbed wire or something like that. I mean, there's there's oh, none yeah, of you got to be within reason. Got to be within reason. But but uh, I I I uh, I tend to make I try to make everybody happy, and I allow them to have a say in the process, right? And uh, and there's not been many things that I said no, I wouldn't do that. Now I've built some things that I thought was ugly, absolutely <laughs> thought was ugly. And and uh, and I show them a picture of what I think is ugly before I build it, and they say, "Man, that's beautiful! Don't you think that's beautiful?" Yeah, sure. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> that's good. So then I build it, right? And away it goes. And I'm the greatest Bitman spur maker ever because I made them happy. Yeah. Right? That's all that matters. I made them happy. Uh, yeah. They don't have to like your wife. You're the one married to her, right? So exactly. Uh, that's, that's exactly right. So with regard to the the engraving and the laying out and, and um you know i don't know the the technology or the uh, the correct terms but i'm just going to call them little swoopies those little curls that scrolls. Sort of, yeah, scrolls uh scrolls okay there we go thank you how do you go about laying that out and making sure you have symmetry I'm, I'm sure symmetry is important to you i'm guessing you're drawing it first and then overlaying or do you ever just freehand and try not to trap yourself in the maze and paint yourself into a corner or how does and I bet you uh, that's been a learning process. You probably have 
have a scrap pile with a bunch of scrolls in it somewhere in the shop that didn't work out and you had to redo. So I got I got books of drawings, right? Books and books and books. And if you can't draw it, you can't cut it. So I spend a lot of time drawing. That that I know unless this is video is shared, you can't see the, the drawing that I showed a while ago of that bit shank, but but uh, it all starts on it it's so I use technology. I, I I'm I'm good with technology, but I will I will draw on paper, exploratory drawings on paper. And then, and then I can take that to my computer and through CAD designs, I will, if things have to be mirror images of each other, it's very easy to do that on a computer, right? Because because you can copy and paste. You can also take a piece of, uh, a piece of uh, vellum, transparency paper, cut it in half or fold it in half, draw on one side, flip it over, trace the other side, and you got the same damn thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Just one's electric, one's manual. So it's just how you go about doing it. Technology is not a cheat. It, it doesn't draw the pretty pictures for me. It just helps me draw the pretty pictures. Yeah. just like a, a template or anything like that. So constantly exploring things. Bits and spurs have a lot of very abstract shapes and places to put decorations and, and spurs do. And so you're <laughs> you can create mechanical nightmares for yourself if you're not careful. So experience tells you when and when not to do that. And, and away you go. So yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I spend a lot of time drawing. I'm not as good at it as I was. I, uh, business is, is catching up, but I used to spend 30 minutes to an hour every morning drawing. Um, I'm out here in my drawing time every morning I'm not all the time doing it on paper anymore. Sometimes I'm exploring on, on the computer. I use Photoshop a lot. So I'll go to, I'll go to my CAD program, perfect my architecture there, send that over to Photoshop in a PDF file. And then, and then with a Wacom tablet, which means I I'm drawing with a little pen directly onto the computer screen, mm -hmm. um, just like pencil and paper. Um, Photoshop allows me to have all kinds of different brushes and colors and all kinds of different things that that gives me advantages in creating a, a, a visualizing what it is that's in my head. So if I get it all drawn down on paper, like with a customer that wants a really high end piece, you're fixing to spend 20 grand. You probably want to see what it's going to look like before we get started. Make sure that things are rocking and rolling so i'll give them a, a finished drawing digital drawing say hey what do you think of this send it to them email man that's awesome i love it or hey can we move that bird over it's in the wrong spot right or whatever mm -hmm. so do all that and then away we go but it, it, it's three months plus 25 years right it's that yeah. it's that thing we talked about earlier you can't you can't you can't forget the past knowledge and the years it took to get there absolutely well i guess on on the the materials of, of bits and all do you have certain metals like like do you always use a, a certain type of steel for the cheeks do you play around with that i'm assuming you don't do much in aluminum but, no, but, uh, aluminum, then, um, i play with things a little bit well go ahead and then gold and silver and copper i guess would be your your typical add-on metals so i'm sure there's a different way of going about brazing or soldering or whatever you have to do to make those things work so yeah there, there's there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat so to speak i i can I, my philosophy is if you start out with a turd you end up with a turd um so so i try to use good metal i use 4130 for a lot of stuff like my spur shanks and my spur bands is 4130 my rowels are 4130 the hinges are 4130. I'll use some 1018 cold finish steel. That's just a mild steel. Nothing special about that. One of the best pair of spurs ever made was just good old A36 hot roll though, right? Just regular old steel. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it doesn't, it probably doesn't make a huge difference at the end of the day about the actual quality of the product. Thickness makes a difference, right? Having enough material to, uh, to accomplish what it is you want to do and create durability. I'm, I'm, I, but I am exploring all the time too. I just had some, uh, just had some advice on some T1 steel. You say it's extremely strong. It's what they use to build cranes out of and the, the booms and all that stuff. Extremely strong, has high memory deal. 
Um, I'm very curious how it all works out. They say it cuts really good. Are you saying T is in Texas or D is in dog? No, T, T in Texas. Okay. T1. I was going to say, yes, if you ever use D1, uh, like we use that for knife steels, that, that yeah. will, uh, that will test your religion. So, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. That tool steel. Yeah. So, and I know, so like my spurs, my bits, so the 4130, you can definitely harden and, and temper. Um, I don't do any of that. Really, it's not really necessary. It happens occasionally through work hardening and things like that. But if there's a special thing, if somebody wanted a quarter inch bar for a mouthpiece, you know, some kind of weird deal, well, then when they needed it to be strong, well, then I could use some 4130, you know, material and temper it, and make it to where it was hard, but not, not, not uh, crystallized, right? But yeah, I'm all the time playing. I don't, as far as my ornamentation, Silver and gold, no nickel, no copper, no brass. It's silver and gold. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it, it's just, it, again, it, precious metals, right? They, mm -hmm. they they last. They endure. Copper's copper's great. I had a, I had a customer come to me one time. I said, Wilson, I want to, I want to, I want you to build me a pair of spurs. I said, awesome. And he was a little. He heard I was an expensive son of a gun, right? He was a little nervous about what this pair of spurs was going to cost, and he was dancing around. He said, I want copper, brass, and silver. I said, perfect. Nickel, nickel. I said, perfect. We'll use silver and gold. He said, no, no, I like the color combination of those, Wilson. I said, yeah, me too. So we'll use rose gold, yellow gold, and, and sterling silver. But Wilson, no, no, I don't want brass and copper. And I said, I'm not going to do brass and copper. I'm not going to do it. He said, why? I said, because it's crappy material. We don't want a crappy pair of spurs. And he's like, but I don't want to spend 20000 I said, we don't have to spend twenty thousand. It's like a hundred bucks for that. So it's we're spending yeah. five thousand on the Spurs. You know, I mean, what's a hundred bucks? Good gosh! <laughs> Start out with good stuff. You're like, oh, okay. So away we went. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my reasoning, though, because because copper and brass will turn green, nickel turns green. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming you do use copper in some mouthpieces. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll use it in mouthpieces. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they get lots of copper in mouthpieces. So I guess we've talked a little bit about numbers. What sort of a waiting list do you have right now if someone might be interested? Uh, so in I, right before we called, uh, let's just say three years, but right before you, I was making phone calls, lining stuff up this morning. And uh, <laughs> it's always one of the deals I have to reintroduce myself. I'm Wilson Caper, the guy that you ordered a pair of spurs from two <laughs> centuries ago, you know. <laughs> I did what? I don't even remember. This guy, this guy I talked to was June of 2018. He did not remember. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, man, life's kind of changed a little bit. Can we go a different direction and just you forget about me? And I said, absolutely. I don't care. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. I wasn't planning on uh, spending seven grand on a pair of spurs this week. So, yeah. Yeah. I said, I didn't really have that in the schedule. So, but I right now what I tell people is three years, and um, it's probably I don't know Daniel. It, there's so many different things of the business side of it that, that's hard to do. I've had people, I've had close friends tell me, he said you got to pick your customers, and and when you get into the real high end deal and all that is is to truly do what it is you want to do, you kind of need to pick your customers. You need to pick the projects. And I've always felt like an asshole. I felt like they were assholes by saying, I won't build you. I won't give you the opportunity to pay me for a pair of spurs. That just, that didn't sound right to me. But I get I, I apologize it. for burning the Alec Baldwin bridge for you right now. <laughs> I'm sure he's in that book somewhere. And I what, that up. what Alec Baldwin needs to know is, is that I can, I'm in the enhancement business and I can help him feel better about himself. If he just gets one of my bits, my pair of spurs or a belt buckle, right? If he wants to be, if he wants to be that guy, I can help him. Right. So I, I haven't, we haven't burned any bridges with Alan. He just, he just going to have to ignore my gun. Right. <laughs> no, but, but uh, it is one of those things where, and it's not, it's not just a checkbook, right? That's certainly a part of it, because because it requires a checkbook to 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 join the journey on on the endeavors I want to do with my bits and spurs, right? Is is I 
I, I cherish and embrace the art aspect of it in a way I go. So it's, it's not because you're not a good horseman. It's not because you're not a good person. It's because I want to spend three months on a project. And, and if I have, if I have a dozen people lined up that want me to spend three months on a project, a piece, well, that's a considerable waiting list with just those 12 people. And, you know, that's three years worth of work right there. So, so the old boy that shows up and says, Hey, Willie, I want a $3,000 pair of spurs. That's certainly nothing to sneeze at. Right. But, but maybe I should respectfully show them somebody else that can do a quality job as well. And, and, uh, you know, because I, I really do want to build a market for the really, really high end custom pieces, just like the guys that are building $150,000 shotguns are spending just as much time and education and energy on those guns as I am my bits and spurs. And they won't build you a $2,000 deal, right? They're yeah. just not going to do it. Yeah. So that, that that's kind of the direction I'm headed in it. And it, it's a little hard for me to say that. I, I, I don't know how to say it yet. I guess I just told the world on your podcast. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I, I view your stuff more as, I mean, it's like buying a Picasso. Yeah. or something you know you, you it it's art and it's collectible and and no matter what you pay for it i mean we're all sitting around waiting on you to die and then it's going to be worth a whole lot more so no you know no offense or anything there but oh it's, it's the truth uh, yeah it's i mean truth. you can like billy clapper to me is is kind of one of those ultimately collectible guys if, if you have one of his bits or something it could be 40 years old you throw that in a cabinet somewhere and pull it down in 10 years and you're going to triple what you bought it for you know it's yeah. just that simple so and i almost hate that for you just in the fact that people are probably a lot more reluctant to actually use your stuff but well, i'm just a weirdo it, like that i find a, a pair of spurs is most beautiful once you see where the blue jeans were touching it and yeah. polished it a little bit here and the oh. inside of the, the the boot that was touching the band and, and you see that use and the rowels a little flattened on the inside from rubbing up and there's a little hair caught up in there you know from from that sorrel horse you want on the rope and that's when that pair of spurs is most beautiful to me it really is it, so. it it's a it it's one of the greatest honors for me to somebody to use them. my dad's wearing a twenty five thousand dollar pair of spurs he, he wearing them all the time <laughs> and and the day he started wearing them i thought well those will never look the same <laughs> <laughs> guess what five years into him wearing them regularly uh, they look pretty close to the same and and uh, it's really cool so it is a great honor either way I, I, will, I was about to say it's a great honor for somebody to use them it's also a great honor for somebody to put them in their house and say this is so special I don't want to use them yeah. but but it is equally special for me when somebody comes back and says Willie I wore the rouse out I wore the rowel pin out I, the bits worn out, right? Is that is that that is that is a huge honor, and to me, to that person that is brave enough to use them, that that piece has more value to them than the one that puts them in a shadow box in their house and never does anything with them, because now their story is absolutely connected. Their blue jeans, their hair, their their. Yeah. My dad got his ass. He nearly got. He got bucked off a couple years ago, brain bleed, cracked his ass, man. I mean, it was a bad deal. He was wearing those spurs. It exploded the spur leathers off his boot when he hit the ground. He hit so hard, right? It, it broke the spur leathers. The spurs are fine. And when my dad's on and gone and we've recovered from, from losing him and we can laugh and giggle about the stories of my dad when he was 75 years old, he got his ass bucked off wearing these spurs, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> on old Merriman. And, and so – you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's special. Those are new stories. And, and so uh, I absolutely love it when people use it. And, and I, I actually hate it. I hate, I feel defensive and I feel like I need to say something when somebody says that's jewelry. Well, that's, that's a bit of slap in my face because I feel like it's it's a it's a big compliment on one side because I did it so pretty, right? That they they say, wow, that's that's above just the deal. But it was made to use. 
right? And, and, I, and I put a lot of time and effort into creating a functional piece. Now, you want to really slap me in the face, tell me, well, that's just a bit. And they label me as a utilitarian, right? That's just a tool. So all that pretty that you did on there is absolutely unnecessary. I'm sorry, you drove up in a pretty fancy pickup. You can't yeah. tell me that you didn't get them roll up windows for a reason. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You said something a second ago that, that I was, it was about your dad getting bucked off. Oh. <laughs> and I've, I've lost it. That's all right. Yeah, he brain bleed, spent a night in the hospital. Not the first night, mind you. No, no, hell no. <laughs> he had to st- he had to stay at the house and make sure he's going to survive, and then he'd go to the hospital and see what was happening. Yeah, we, we get a little. Uh, I broke my leg last August. Oh. And I have I've led a fairly rough life. I've I started thousands of horses, and, and uh, I once fell three floors down an elevator shaft. I played rugby in college. I fell out of a deer tree stand about thirty five feet one time. Uh, I've I've had my ass kicked a whole lot of different ways. A lot of times, I've never broken a bone. Oh. And uh, one of my kids' show steers got me down, loading him out of a trailer. It just caught my leg was on the edge of concrete and mud, and he stepped right there. And Well, I didn't know it. I thought I'd sprained my ankle. I walked around on it for about a month, and I used crutches and all that, and the swelling finally went down. I had a damn broken leg. My fibula now can feel uh, got a little it knot on it. it. Yeah, it healed like this instead of like that. You know. Oh, man. So I understand your dad there. At some point, you just – yeah, well, I'll be all right. You know, I've always been all right before. Why wouldn't I be all right this time? Yeah, Pop's good. He's a tough old carter. You get mad at him if you heard him say call him old. <laughs> 77. <laughs> if you heard I called him old, he'd be kicking my butt. You're only as old as the woman you feel, right? So uh, <laughs> That's it. That's it. Well, what about guns a little bit? Let's, let's talk about that. So uh, when I called you the other day, you had just come back from – a long range varmint shoot is that right? What what are you shooting? Well, varmint well, is not really long range. We'll shoot them from the point of the muzzle to as far as we. <laughs> <laughs> they got they got varmint contests down here, so so uh, there's different things to do. They they uh, wait the big the guy that kills the biggest or the team that kills the biggest bobcat they're gonna pay you forty thousand dollars for the biggest bobcat. Seriously? Seriously? So Goodness gracious. So when you called me the other day, I was in the middle of that contest. Me and another, you can have a four-man team. You can enter two to four people in this contest. But um, there's two contests going on at the same time. One's a big, big bob. They call it the big cat contest. So you got to kill five fox and a bobcat to weigh your bobcat. Um, there's little jackpots that they have on the on the side streets, kind of like it at the craps table you know so if you the guy that kills the biggest fox or the most fox or the biggest coyote or the most coyotes that there's all biggest raccoon those are all jackpot type of things well between the two contests the heaviest fox i think it was a little over forty thousand dollars for the heaviest fox if you combine the two contests together one guy killed a 12 pound fox there was first through third was was 12 pound fox but anyhow we, we don't have a lot of cats around here a lot of big cats but we got a lot of fox so we were trying to shoot the elusive fox to mm-hmm. win the deal. No, we didn't do a damn bit of good. <laughs> well, I got to say, when I lived around, uh, around Weatherford, I thought we had some coyotes in Louisiana. We yeah. don't have any coyotes in Louisiana. I mean, they're roadkill out there. There's so many coyotes, yeah. you can't imagine it. When I went to work at that place, I was, I was a two-year-old man, and, and – they had some bad stuff going on there. So the horses were way behind and, and Hey, I don't know anybody. I got nothing to do. I mean, I'm, I'm riding right. horses from six o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. Well, one of those 10 o'clock at night nights, I'm in the barn. I'm all by myself and coyotes surrounded that barn. And it sounded like there were <laughs> a thousand of those damn things out yeah. there. And we got horses in paddocks all around. And I mean, I'm shutting things down, putting horses up, and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it to my truck. You know, I mean, I'm right. hairs up on the back of my neck. Yeah. No incident. I come back the next morning, first thing I'm expecting, we're going to have dead horses in paddock. I've never heard so many coyotes in my life. And, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it was a non event. But so anybody feeling bad about them shooting varmints, trust me, they got plenty you know, of. So oh, I'll get to your gun question here in a minute, but, but as far as like these varmint contests, man, I, I mean, they have 800 teams of people killing critters all over the state of Texas. You know I mean? It's why it's paying so good. 
I mean, you can start out, you start out hunting at noon on Saturday. You hunt all Saturday afternoon, all night Sunday, and you have to be back in San Angelo at a store by 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock Sunday morning. So if you want to start hunting in Amarillo five hours away, just leave at five o'clock in the morning and you make it, right? Mm -hmm. So you got people all over. And I thought, man, there's not going to be a varmint left in the country. Everybody killing all these critters. Well, I think it's a little bit like the animals in Africa. The greatest conservation plan that they've done to Africa is have hunters because it creates value with the animals. Yep. So now they now everybody's protecting them because there's value in them. And that's the way it is with these varmints. Now, now my buddy say, oh, no, we can't hunt. We got to wait and save it for the contest. Uh -huh. We only hunted it once last year. Let's go. Let's go. No, you save it. Might kill the big cat. Might kill the big fox. I'm like. Now we got fox and coyotes running out our ears because <laughs> nobody will hunt the dang critters. Or they were they were hunting them every time they saw one, right? They shoot, shoot. Now, oh no, that's a forty thousand dollar cat. Don't shoot it. <laughs> so, it's all good. Yep. I, my so my gun interest. So I'm not a I'm not a gun fanatic, right? I'm not a guy. I, I don't have a safe full of guns. That that doesn't interest me. But my dad served in Vietnam in the Marine Corps, and and. Uh, Growing up, uh, he hunted a lot as a kid, and and uh, we hunted some growing up, hunted rabbits and different things like that. But every time we'd get a gun, and I was going to go to shoot it, we'd have a forty-five minute dissertation on sight picture on the hood of the truck. Right? <laughs> I'm like, guys, want to pull the trigger? But the deal was, is, is marksmanship was instilled in me at a very early age, and and so sniper stuff was always very intriguing to me and, and as i got in high school uh carlos hathcock 93 confirmed kills book came out and and my dad had not really talked a lot about vietnam and his experiences with vietnam and and uh he got that book somebody gave him that book and he read it and he gave it to me and said you need to read this book this this is very similar to what i experienced in vietnam my dad wasn't a sniper but uh, but it was at the same time period same location saigon some uh, case on, I mean, not Saigon, case on. And, and um, so I read it. And at that point, sniper deal became really cool, right? The marksmanship became really cool. Well, I had a friend after I moved to Midland that had taken Gunworks as a company up in Wyoming and they'd started doing some long range schools and creating uh, the ability for a common old Joe like me to learn a few mathematical things without having to go to college and learn how to shoot and long range. And man, that's just, that was the funnest thing in the world for me. So you can go down to the Academy now and get you a savage, a savage rifle for 800 bucks and it'll shoot a half minute group and you can shoot a thousand yards out of the box and by God, you're good. Mm -hmm. I have zero interest in that because there's no heart and soul in that savage out of the box i want to spend hey, we gotta spend 10 grand on one because my buddy made it right he's like me so i have high taste bulldog mouth and the chihuahua butt but but i get into that as i as i is is a, a finely made tool is something really special to me so that's fun and marksmanship is way cool so if you got a, a finely made tool or instrument and, and a skill to go with it well that's fun yep that's really fun me and my buddies used to shoot. We, we grew up right on the Mississippi River levee, so that was our backdrop. And there were a few spots where you could you could drive down to the bottom of the levee, and it would make a ninety degree turn, and you could shoot five or six hundred yards. So we'd fill up wow. two liter bottles and you know put them out there. And man, that was, that's really cool when you're shooting far enough that you can pull the trigger and then get your sight picker picture back and watch it explode. Yeah. You know, that's you get the whole uh, <laughs> part of it there. Yeah. Are, are you, you're, you're spotting, you see it, you see the target move and then you hear it hit later. Uh -huh. right? That's, yeah. the, that's the awesome. coolest thing ever. And I'm a real big fan. I, I'm a Smith and Wesson revolver guy. So I like shooting them at far ranges. I, I can shoot you in the head at a hundred yards with an iron sight revolver. That's and cool. I, I think it's great. Yeah. I love going to the range when guys are sighting in their deer rifles and they're shooting, you know, a 10 inch group with that thing. And then I go out there with my pistol free hand and out. Shooting. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite things in the world to do right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I haven't shot a pistol a lot. I qualified for my concealed to carry thing here in Texas and, and all that. I told my buddy, I said, Hey, shouldn't I practice? And he called me. So let's go get our concealed carry license. 
It's like, man, I ain't shot a pistol 10 times. Let's go do it. And he's like, dude, at three yards, you can't hit the damn target. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so I did. It, it wasn't any big deal. But, but, uh, and a shotgun, you're safe, completely safe. If, if you're going to take off running, you want me to hit you? You're good. I ain't going to hit you. Birds are safe. Doves are safe at my house. I got them. And in the varmint deal, them little boogers don't sit still very long, right? And so you got to be – I have to shoot them on the, on the move. Uh, per, let me rephrase that. I have to shoot at them on the move an awful lot. And sometimes I hit them, but I shoot at them most of the time. When I did my concealed weapons class, it was kind of a spur of the moment thing, sort of like that with a buddy. Uh -huh. And I reload – a lot and the only gun i had enough i think you had to shoot 50 rounds or something like that the only gun i had enough ammo for was a 44 magnum <laughs> and it's a, an indoor gun range i've heard a statistic that 90 percent of 44s never have more than 50 shells shot through them well, we shoot the hell out of ours and it was yeah. my wife's gun it's got an eight and three eighths inch barrel big old dirty hairy looking <laughs> <laughs> And we're at an indoor range, and he puts the paper up. Like you say, it's at like five feet or something. Yeah. And I shoot, and the concussion of the gun, I mean, the <laughs> blows back, and I got to wait 10 seconds for it to float back down. Yeah. And I said, uh, can I run this out there a little ways? I'm not going to miss. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> so he let me put it out there, and, and we shot our deal. But yeah. a 44 in a in an indoor range, that's, that's pretty loud. <laughs> <I'll tell you. laughs> <laughs> after um after my concealed to carry deal i was I, I i felt good about the world carrying a gun until i went to my concealed carry course and seeing yeah. how people shoot oh no i'm not so my buddy would have had a perfect score except his neighbor hit his target <laughs> yeah. five yards like, good gosh dude what are you doing so yeah it, it's bad people don't shoot real good and not and again i'm not I'm not Mr. Annie Oakley, but but still. We had a lady like that. She came with like a little bucket, like a country crop container. Yeah. She had a 38, and that was what her shells were in. And I don't know that she'd ever shot a gun before. And none of them matched. I mean, they were all something different. Yeah. She got a couple that got locked in her gun. I don't know if they were 357 rounds she tried to shoot in there or I mean what. But it, it was exactly that same kind of a thing. You're, you're going... This lady's about to be walking around with a, with a locked and loaded gun. Man, I don't know that I feel better well, about that. But. There was an individual that came to our class that I know was SEAL. He might have been SEAL Team 6 by the way he was dressed. Like, uh -huh. I was like, this boy, like, I need to sit by him because he's going to be able to shoot. Him and his wife, man. And, and I, you could tell he'd spend his life at the range. It was all costume. He couldn't hit the broad side of the barn with that pistol and i was like holy shit it surprised the hell out of me yeah. but yeah i think i'd a lot because i was the dude that showed up with a coffee can full of bullets you know like hey where do i what do i do here right <laughs> tactical i used to have a uh this was my sole varmint rifle it was my college graduation gift uh it was a remington 700 which is my favorite platform it was yeah. their varmint special in a 220 swift and the 220 swift wow. has always been just my yeah, you know, you'll burn a barrel out in a few hundred rounds, but you'll have a lot of fun in the meantime. You know, I, I have, I have, I had. That's kind of on my wish list. If I'm going to dip over into the quantity deal, I'd like a 220 suit. Man, and the first time I ever shot it, I was breaking in the barrel. It was a humid morning, and that thing was shooting a vapor trail. Oh, I mean, it, it, just a smoke line going all the way out to the target. It was, it was. I felt pretty badass. I'll just be honest about it. It was super cool. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I was at the range shooting it, and they had a group of those guys like you talking about the whole tactical thing on the other uh, end. And I had just shot what I suspected was the best group of my life, and I did not have a micrometer with me. So uh, I figured, well, these guys got all the gear. You know, I'm going to walk down there and uh, ask if they got one. And they were shooting an AR. They were trying to sight it in. I swear that scope was eight inches on top of the barrel. I've never seen <laughs> a jacked up truck scope. I've never seen anything like this. And they're trying to hit paper at 25 yards. And I, like you, I wasn't paying a lot of attention. I figure, you know, they dressed the part. They got on $8,000 worth of clothes and crap over there. They probably they got full plate kit and the whole nine yards. And uh, so I go down there for a micrometer. I realize they're trying to hit paper at 25 yards. 
Anyway, it wound up being a twelve hundredths of a group of a, a inch shot oh. group at a hundred yards. Best group I've ever had. You may have yeah. had nicer than that, but I was I was pretty happy with it. You know. Oh, that's awesome. So, anyway. That's way cool. Well, I would like to have one. I shoot a six oh six, which is a twenty five out six snake down to a six millimeter a lot. That was my first custom rifle. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. Man, it, it's a speed demon to yeah. thirty eight. Deep Even a twenty five oh six will burn a barrel up, so I bet that really does it. Yeah. It does. It cooks pretty good. Put a seventy grain bullet in it, and it's it'll it'll smoke down there. But man, what a killing machine as far as as a as a lethal weapon. Five hundred yards in the end with that seventy grain bullet. Boy, that sucker's good. I, I got a big chief story to tell you. One time, I had a me and my brother in law uh, were were in a little jeep one time, and a guy he had a couple buddies with him, and and. Uh, we, we got a big right away on the ranch and it was a, the perfect morning right cool no wind still and there's a deer little buck down there, a little two-year-old deer good meat deer but no trophy type of thing or anything no no anyhow traps said, there's one really shoot it and i said no i ain't gonna shoot him. little old kid i ain't let him grow up and get bigger well the guy in, in the hunting rack up on top he said i'm i need some meat he said that'd be perfect one if y'all don't mind shooting him i said oh he'd be all right he said you shoot him I said, all right. So at that time, I had a little calculator on my phone, you know, and a ballistic calculator and figured it all up. Figure out an ash trap, how far is he? And I'm dialing it up on the scope and the turret and all that stuff. And I lean back in the seat and I put my knee up on the windshield. It's old Jeep. We got the Jeep. We got the windshield laid down. We're up there. And uh, boom, I shot him. Well, he just crumbled, right? And the guy, before I pulled the trigger, said, headshots only. And I kind of, I, I like the headshot, right? You either hit him or you don't. Right. And so there ain't, there ain't no, and no it, waste of meat either. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't hurting no meat. Well, I hit him right square between the eyes when we got there, you know, and, and I, I couldn't do it another hundred times, but it was one of those moments that it just, it happened and I'm walking around like I'm a badass, you know, and all that. But it was, so I did call it, right? I said, yeah, headshot. Okay. There it went. And then when it actually happened, well, that guy was like, and he told me before he said, I'll wash the dishes if you shoot him. And after I shot him, he was, I'll wash them for a month after that, dude. Like, that's incredible. 400 yards isn't that far anymore. At that time, I, I felt that was a pretty good poke, you know. But yeah. I guess it is if you're going to try to hit him between the eyes, but which we might get in trouble, might not be ethical and all that business. But did the uh, job. He didn't feel a thing and he didn't even hear it before he felt it. So, yeah. The <laughs> results was the most ethical thing you could possibly do, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll probably ought to get back on horses or bits or something like that. Oh, yeah. you, you got a horse wreck story for me? Anything stick out in your mind? From, can, you, can you see that scar? Starts. It starts actually. You see the little shiny part? Uh huh. Yep. All right. It starts over here and it ends over here. <laughs> I got scalped. I when I was fifteen. I'm riding a five year old, putting the second saddle on a five year old, and it's one of those jobs my dad took on. And, and uh, we don't have a round pin. It's a good old square pin deal. Here, kid, get on him. And, and I rode him the day before, and everything's fine. Well, I don't know. He was moving him around. I'm just a monkey on the football up there, right? And anyhow, old Blue Duck. He was a blue roan, so they named him Blue Duck. That was when Lonesome Dove was. Mm -hmm. wasn't, that the, wasn't that on Lonesome Dove, Blue Duck? Yeah, he was He was the bad guy. Yep. Yeah, he was the bad guy. So, anyhow, I'm on old Blue Duck, and he broke in two. And I rode him till he went to the corner. And stopped, and I was Donny Gay's yard dart at the bottom of the fence, and it scalped me. <laughs> so it's all good. There's all kinds of man, you know. I I, <laughs> I roped a steer one time. Uh, by the way, they had to do a little stitch in there on my head. It's a ten inch scar. Got me all sewed back up. Obviously, I kept my hair. It all went underneath the hair follicles and all that. It took the membrane off the skull and all that. But, so me back up. Maybe that's why I ramble on like I do. But no concussion, nothing, you know, just cut me like a cheese grater. Now, I kind of went into shock, some things like that. We were 30 miles from the hospital, but it's all good. Uh -huh. I roped I roped, uh, I roped, a steer one time in college. And mind you, I was still pretty ranchy, pretty Western at that point. For the first couple of years, I, I was not full-blown team roper at that point. I roped uh, – I roped the steer in both front feet of my horse. And then as I was a, probably a sophomore in college, I didn't have enough money to, to buy a new rope and not enough knowledge to know how to tie a little knot at the end of it if it comes unraveled. So I just tied an overhand knot in the end of my rope. Well, 
when I wrote when I wrote the steer and I wrote both front feet of my horse, we might have been a little close. Uh, the knot did not slip out real good. So when I pitched it, I pitched the rope going, oh, no, this is good because the old horse is leaping and lunging and trying to get free. and He's hobbled now, right? And uh, <laughs> as things separated, we looked like John Wayne shot us. Man, we chillied out there on our head. And, and uh, I survived the wreck. He, he, I landed out there in front of him. He rolled over the top of me. And when he got up, he rolled all the way over me. So when he got up, he kicked me right square in the top of the head. And, uh, of course, after the being scalped, there's, I don't have a ton of feeling up there, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can feel, but it ain't quite yeah. as good as it used to be. And uh, so I'm going to kind of go like that. And my buddy, God, dude, you okay, dude? And I'm I'm crawling. I, when I'm hurt, I don't sit still very good. I'm kind of – I'm moving. I'm like, sit still. Like, I can't. It hurts, right? <laughs> and uh, then they said – Oh my God, you're bleeding, you're bleeding. I said, Well, what's it look like? And I said, Ooh, I don't know. I said, Well, let's go clean it up in the house. We get in the house. They said, Let's put some hydrogen peroxide on. I said, Hell no, y'all just want to turn my hair orange. So <laughs> went to the doctor. I got a few I got I went to the doctor so they could use something beside hydrogen peroxide. And I got a few stitches out of that deal too. But I've I've had a few of them, you know. It, it's I got a funny one. <laughs> so I, I college rodeoed, and uh, man, I thought I could rope okay. I only made one college short round my whole college career. Right, I, I didn't win a whole lot of checks, and in that one college, I didn't win any college checks. Let me rephrase that: I didn't win any college checks, and I was uh in that one short round, a leg made it back. So me and Sean Darnell, we made it back with a leg. Not Sean's fault. It was probably my handle that created the wreck. He was probably lucky to get a leg out of the deal I created for him. But anyhow, we draw a run and son of a gun. We're in New Valley, Texas, and the arena comes to a point. Well, I'm getting outrun like a by gosh, and Sean's up there hazing at the head, kind of pushing him over to me, which is what he's supposed to do. Well, just about the time I get to him, the steer cuts left hard. And uh, the horse I'm riding takes a left too, but what none of us knew, me, steer, or horse, is the Whataburger sign was coming up at a high rate of speed. Whoa! We hit the Whataburger sign dead on, head on, right? Just whap bam We go into the Whataburger sign <laughs> because the arena's coming to a point. Well, Gray was a really nice head horse. Between the time you nodded and the time that you faced, but your life was in your own hands after that point. Is he? He wasn't. He was. He was typical team roping horse. It wasn't. I wouldn't ride him to the mailbox. Yeah. Well, when I hit the Waterburger sign, I ended up in front of the saddle horn, both front, both feet still in the stirrups, but I'm in front of the saddle horn, in between the ears and the saddle horn on old Gray's neck, still holding the reins in my rope like this, right? <laughs> and Sean looked at him. He looked over at me and said, what the hell are you doing? I said, getting off, dude. This is dangerous. <laughs> so I grabbed a hold of the, of the fence and fell off out there in the middle of the arena, you know. Had to walk all the way back up the arena with my rope in my hand, swinging my rope, you know, my great crazy horse running around the damn arena. <laughs> that was embarrassing. That was probably the most embarrassing wreck I've ever had. We went to Mexico after that and drowned in our sorrows. But that's my college career. That that sums up my college rodeo and career. So that's it. That, that sounds good. I had I used to ride bulls, and I was went through several phases in my bull riding career. Uh, the first phase was I I couldn't cover anything. You know, I, I was a two second rider, and then I went through a period where I got hung up like every damn. <laughs> My parents only ever came to two of three of my rodeos and two of the ones they came to were ones where I got hung up. And when your mom watches you get hung up, that's, that's not a good thing. Oh, it's but not good. We had, there were not that many mean bulls in that area. It was the same stock contractor, you know, that he did mm -hmm. all the little stuff around there, but they had one named swamp rat and he was kind of a small bull, maybe 1500 pounds and had the, the mismatched gnarly little horns brindle he just the ugly bastard you know he was never gonna pick him out of the pasture and go no that's a nice bull he was the opposite but he was a mean mean little dude yeah. and so i got on him one night and I, I don't know how many seconds i didn't make my eight second ride but i got hung up at the end of it and when you're hung up it seems like you're there for 10 minutes i mean it just, oh, he yeah. probably circled me eight times or something but he couldn't <laughs> couldn't really get me 
right there. I was inside his neck. So as he was trying to horn me, his horn was going behind me. And, and I, I was kind of in the pocket, you know, like the eye of the hurricane. When I got unhung, he immediately knocked me down. And I mean, he just tattooed right over the front of me. I landed on my back and I had one of those vests. And I did not have a bruise underneath that vest. Those things were awesome. But he stepped right on my face. I still have a little scar basically where his hoof was. I got a little one on my chin and a little one on my eyebrow. And so he goes over the top of me. As soon as that happens, I get try to get up and get in the fetal position. Well, he turned around and he came back the other way. And he, he knocked me face first down and tattooed all over me. Yeah. So that was our Friday night practice deal. The next night we had the real rodeo and uh, go to – get my my drawing and all that stuff and the guys are, are laughing at me they go you know you drew, you drew your buddy and i thought they were just messing around and no they bring him up into the chute and, you know put your rope on him <laughs> like, yeah. oh great and i still i got a black eye you know the whole damn side of my face is swollen oh, so yeah. i go to get on him and i get hung up on that sucker again that night i think i rode him four seconds and he wasn't the kind of bull you were going to win on anyway i mean he was the worst draw Right. Well, as I'm hung up, he steps in my back pocket and ripped my jeans clean down to my Daniel's <laughs> white ass out in the middle of the arena. <laughs> so, oh, and it, it was a a two ride deal. So I had to go get safety pins from the ladies that put your number on your vest, oh, and I had no. to safety pin my jeans back together, and then go ride another bull right after that. So that was oh. maybe my worst bull riding. Uh, I never really got hurt other than that, but he did step on my face and give me a little lucky yeah. he didn't split me open like a melon. But you anyway. got a hard head too, then, right? I, I think so. Yep. I always tell people, I say, if you want to, if you really want to hurt me, don't hit me in the head. <laughs> it, it ain't. Yeah. I mean, hit me in the knee. I had three knee operations in, in high school, you know, uh, football. Yeah. Baby calves. Uh, tasting pennies is just a normal part of life at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's oh. it. Well, do we have any more bit and spur territory to cover? Have I left something out that you wanted to to get to? Well, you know, I, I um. Oh, why don't you talk about your your Patreon? And that's oh, sure. you starting. Yeah. Yeah, talking about education, right, and all that is uh. Uh, Kerry Schwartz, saddle maker from Idaho. If y'all don't know him, you should. That guy's an incredible saddle maker. One of the founding members of the TCA, kind of beginning thoughts started with Kerry. But Kerry's one that got me started on it. And, and I'd heard of Patreon. I, I follow some blacksmith guys that do it. But it's a deal of – it's a social media platform, subscription social media platform. So I got three tiers, a dollar a month, $5 a month, or $20 a month. A uh, dollar a month is is for those guys, for those individuals that want to say thank you for the for what I'm doing for the industry. Maybe you know, just a little token of appreciation. It ain't it ain't gonna do. I'll I'll throw you a little token out there. Um, when I get something done, I'll I'll post on there and 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 uh, give you access to that to that post. Uh, kind of finished product type of things. You know, the just kind of an inside track to see or what's going on, maybe maybe see it there before you see it on social media and not have to search through the things of social media um, to see it. Uh, $5 a month is going to get you two or three videos um, a week of what's going on. Just little, kind of like my Workshop Wednesdays. It's just, it's just a little bit bigger than Workshop Wednesday. And then for $20 a month, you're going to get a video every day I'm in the shop. And so you've joined the journey. The mess ups, the... The, the heartache and soul, the, the heartaches that happen uh, within within a within a day, how to the problem solving, the success stories, everything that's going on. So that's what the twenty dollars a month will get you, and it's doing good, man. I got about fifty people following. The vast majority of those people are twenty dollars a month, and uh, and so far they they're really appreciative. So if you join today. It's, you don't just start getting information today. You get access to all the stuff I've been doing the last several months. And, and uh, so it just, it just accumulates information based there. And so what I'm doing is videos because I am getting comfortable talking in front of the phone. Thanks, Lo. But I'm getting comfortable talking. And, uh, and, and I'm not, it doesn't take me as much time to do a video as it does to type it all out and create a curriculum for people to follow and all that. So. Yeah. That's that's my way of going about. Kerry does he does articles and all different kinds of different things that he posts. But 
but uh that's what i'm doing and, and uh, man it, it's it so if you only watch the videos on the weekend well you can get five or six videos all there one one day right and there my videos are from five minutes to 20 minutes right i did a soldering video one time where you're watching me go at it and uh, uh it's probably 25 minutes or something like that but most of them 10 minutes 10 to 15 minutes but it's good and, and, and it's worldwide right Mm -hmm. So I do, I do my six, my six workshops a year, but, uh, that doesn't mean you can get down here. So you can see my shop, see my world, see how things are set up and uh, join my little journey there. So it's a good thing. I like Patreon. Yeah. I, cool. I cussed Carrie at first. I was like, no, I don't time, time, Carrie. I don't want to do more time. It's taking me away from what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, it is working out pretty good. It is. Okay. Well, we'll do a link to that. Is that through your website or is that a separate deal or, or patreon.com? Okay. You, know, you go to patreon.com and then, and then search me, Wilson Capron and, and uh, it should pop up. Okay. I'll, I'll... I think, <clears throat> I think I'm the only bit and spur maker on there at the moment. Uh, well, no, that's wrong. Ernie Morris has joined the join. He's joined the battle too. So me and Ernie are both on there. Carrie's on there. Um, but not not a lot of us crafts people in our Western culture are on there yet. I know some raw hybriders um, that are doing some stuff, but it's kind of like uh, you know, it's like YouTube. YouTube's a social media platform that YouTube will pay you for your content if you get enough followers and, and people mm -hmm. uh, enough watch time. So so uh, this is a similar situation. It's just you can have fifty viewers like me and still get paid. Where YouTube makes you have a thousand followers. So, so let me ask you this. Do you feel like there is sort of a renaissance going on right now with bitten spur makers and rawhide braiding and, and main hair makatis and all of that kind of stuff? Do you feel like that's growing? Or It seems to me like it is, but I'm not sure if it actually is or if it's just more prevalent on social media so you see it more if you're looking for it. What are your thoughts? Like the TCAA, are, are y'all a membership organization y'all are keeping track of the members and so forth or well so our, um I'll answer one question first T well i'll start with tca tca is is uh there unless you're uh an active member of um we only have one part we only have one form of membership and that's to be uh a maker within our group and and that's that that that's that's I don't know how to exactly say this. I should after being in the group for 17 years, but it's the best of the best. Uh, you have to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk to be a member of our group. And it takes three quarter majority vote to gain membership into our, into our uh, group. I have a personal feeling I'm one of 12. Um, I have a personal feeling that <clears throat> there's not a lot of places for other people to participate in, uh, in our journey as craftsmen. We don't have a place for that now in the TCA. It's a very difficult thing to address, right? Is is where do they fit? Um, I'm I will be the most protective guy in the whole way, whole wide world of what that stamp, that logo means that you see on one of my pieces. Um, that absolutely means quality above and beyond character and 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 uh, the the quality of the product. So an individual that comes to our show that sees that work knows they don't have to worry about whether it's good or not we members we makers have already made that determining factor for you you just have to decide whether you like it right so that's a deal do i see the industry growing i absolutely do and i give a lot of credit to the tca for that i am a product of the tca they started they started when i started the reason i've got to the level that i have with my craft is is one third of the reason is is the tca is is that they've exposed they've exposed quality and they've given you the opportunity to learn as much as you want so i absolutely see everything growing social media has certainly made it <clears throat> easier for us to become known right it gives us a platform to show what it is that we're doing um, social media is good in that sense it's horrible in the other sense and it gives people a lot of confidence and thinking that they don't have to get any better because everybody on social media loves what it is that you've done, whether you, whether you did good or not. Right. And so, yeah. um, uh, you know, it's, it's back to that thing is, is we should pick out, you said there's eight people out there in the world that, that actually know what it is that you've done well. Well, when I got started, my dad said, 
your customer will always like what it is that you create. You need to impress your peers. And that should only be about six people. So you pick those six people out, you build for your customer, do the best possible job you possibly can. Hopefully they like it, but it, the people that you have to impress are those six people that you picked out that truly understand what it is that you're doing. So social media is bad in that sense and that it gives false confidence to a lot of people, you know, because you never see anything negative. Yeah, I, I tell that, that story a little bit, but it, it was um, a moment of maturity for me within the clinician game. I, I was doing the master of ceremonies for an expo, so I wasn't riding it. I was just talking. And there were two other clinicians there that I'd never seen ride before, but I had heard of them. And then I watched them ride all weekend, and I was kind of shocked at how good they weren't, <laughs> I guess. And I'll, I'll not name them, but I mean, and I'm not going to say they were bad. They just weren't, you know, they were B-plus riders. They weren't A-plus riders. And I realized that the rest of the world couldn't tell the difference. And that was just one of those, Well, what so the hell is the point of being being this good when the world doesn't know what the what the yeah. difference is between you know so when i applied to the tca um we're there at the show and and you didn't find out at that point for two or three weeks whether you gained ex gained membership or not and it was all secret ballot the membership didn't know whether you gained membership or not so <clears throat> everybody was kind of there was only one person in the in the county and there was only one person that knew right what what the who counted the votes and, and uh, he certainly wasn't going to share that information for a lot of different reasons but anyhow john ennis came up to me and he said he said hey kid i want you to know something you're really good but you be very careful who you listen to 10 minutes of bad advice can cost you 10 years of your career yeah. and i see a lot of people teaching class nowadays that man i understand why they are because it's money right and they're trying to create a business but dad gum they're just getting started themselves and and for people to go learn from them is, is a scary situation right and and uh, and i often feel people are intimidated to go see somebody that's really really good I, I feel like people are intimidated to come to my house because they know that i can do some pretty cool stuff and so ah, i'm not to that level i don't need to go there yet i'm the absolute first person you should try to come to because I can set you off on the right foot, right? And and going to, and if you get 10, 10 minutes of bad advice and you work for 10 years on that bad advice, that yeah, I finally got there. I'm good enough to go see Wilson. I'm going to tell you, forget all that 10 minutes and that 10 years of experience, and now you're 10 years behind. You know, so. Yeah. Um, that That's a scary situation. And, and everybody's teaching. Europe, you know, in Europe. You have to be an apprentice and you have to be a journeyman and, and then you work your butt off for the vast majority of your life to become a master finally. And uh, we don't have that same setup here in America. It's just we went to college, got our paper. We're good. Yeah. I'm not sure I know how to feel about that. Like you, I, I have some, I guess I'll say libertarian type views of, you know, you do you and, 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 and whatever, and you should have the freedom to do you, whether I agree with that or, or not yeah. or, or whatever. Um, I agree. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, I I apprenticed riding horses for six years under other guys, and it it it, it pisses me off when I see some of these people that think they're ready to teach the world, and and they're still green as grass. And you're just like, you know, man, you got you got years more before you're ready to, well, you know, what you're I, talking about. But and yeah. what happens? What happens is is, and I see this in the bit and sport world. I I actually probably put place more blame on the people asking them to teach them. Than I do the people having the class. Um, if you got 30 people like, dude, I just want you to teach me a class. Come on. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? We'll pay you a thousand dollars. You got 30 people doing it. You're like, Oh, that ain't hard to figure out. <laughs> right? yeah. So, so they go and do it, but it's the people that, that are intimidated or whatever. And they, hell, they're all ignorant too. They don't know what's good and what's not. They're just getting started. Hey, this guy does it. Get him to teach me. It's just, it's just, and I'm with you. Let everybody, if the queers want to get married, they can get married. I'm good with that. I, it's no big deal to me, right? I don't have to answer for them. It's, it's, and, I, and I have friends that are homosexuals, right? I, whatever. Y'all yeah. do that. Y'all, you do you, I'll do me. Um, to get a little political there. But but the deal is, is is with this teaching thing, gosh, dang, it can it can really mess some things up, you know? And, and false confidence, right? I'm a teacher. I, I, and to, So we both graduated from college. I bet you had some professors 
that taught class that couldn't get a job any, doing the actual profession that they were teaching. So they went back to college and taught. A hundred percent. And it's like, if my mom was a teacher and she said, if you, if you fail out of the world and you can't do anything, you can always go back and be a teacher. Yeah. And, that, and that's unfortunate. Some of the greatest influences I've had in my life are, are school teachers and coaches, but, but uh, man, I've had, I've had some negative influences in those experiences too. Yeah. That, that, that's one of the tricks. I mean, uh, like people ask, I say that about clinicians. Whenever I'm posing, sending emails, like I, I knew you, but but some of the people I'm asking on for guests are, are total strangers, no idea who I am. My first line is, my name is Daniel Dawson. I'm one of the 8,713,612 horsemanship clinicians in the United States. <laughs> that's right. I got people, I'm like, you were in a clinic with me three years ago and you couldn't ride forward seven steps and now you're putting on clinics yourself. What? I mean, <laughs> what on, man. Uh, but again, I don't hold it against you. If they're going to come and they're going to spend their money, do whatever. But that is the trick is, is how do you get the public to recognize the, the difference? You know, it, it's that's that's the thing to figure out for me. But it's so hard. We don't have stats, right? We're not in the NFL. And it's, uh, I got 32 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, right? I'm good because we don't have that in our world. I mean, you know, we can show stats. Oh, you sold a $30,000 bid. Well, so what? We don't care. Yeah. What's it? I mean, what does that mean? Yeah, I've had people come to me and say, I don't know if I could build a pair of spurs worth that much. I said, me neither. I haven't sold these yet. <laughs> so I don't know if they're worth that much either. <laughs> We still got them. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, the horse training game is kind of the same deal. You get the whole, you know, well, so-and-so just brought a two-year-old to the futurity sale and sold it for $450,000. So he's, yeah. he's the big swinging uh, ape around here. I'm like, yeah, but I got eight horses in the barn I'm, that he blew the hell out of, and I'm trying to fix and put together right now so you can ride them to the mailbox, you know. So <laughs> you, you, uh, you're you you taking a risk there, too. But anyway. Yeah. Exactly right. All right. Well, uh, man, we've been talking a pretty good little while. You you ready to go get you a sandwich or something, and we'll call this good? I got to tell you, Daniel, so so 12 o'clock is lunchtime. Here we are at 1, my time, your time too, I guess. And uh-huh. uh, the rule is, is from the time you get done eating until 1 o'clock is nap time. <laughs> Dude, we done jacked up nap time. Good gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Remember 3.30? 3.30 gives you the right to be able to take a nap until 1 o'clock when the rest of the world goes back to work at lunch. That's fair enough. Yep. I'm hungry. My I'm wife hungry. has a deal. Anytime I take a nap, she takes a picture of me or something. And oh. I'm like, I work 14 hours a day every damn day. I get up three hours before you do every morning, and you're going to act like I'm a lazy bastard taking a nap every once in a while? Man. That ain't right, man. She she'd wear out her she'd wear out her memory on her phone taking pictures of me because I'm gonna have one every day. I probably won't today. I got to go back to damn work. But well, I tell you, I tell you, man, it's been a pleasure being here and, and uh, being a part of this. I, I I appreciate the ability, the opportunity to share my story and share who I am, and and uh, and I think it's so important, Daniel, with what I'm trying to do as a bid spur maker that that people understand what it is I'm trying to do for them, right? It's not it's not all about me and my and my gold buckle of being the best bit sperm maker in the world. But I do want to become the Mont Blanc. Um, that's operating a quality business and and a creating a product that will last years and years and years past my death. And and long after my name is forgotten, I want people to look at my work and go, that's incredible. Whoever did it however long ago. And, uh, and if I can do that for somebody else and it lives in their, in their world, um, that's good. You know, that's a good thing. And I am selfishly trying to become the only living artist that ever made a living before I die. Right? My kids, <laughs> <laughs> I do want to make a living Yeah, uh, and I want to make a good living. I'm not bashful about that, but, uh, I'm going to charge you more than anybody's ever charged you for a bitter pair of spurs, but I'm going to make you feel like you got every damn penny out of it by the time we're done. Hopefully. So, uh-huh. I think your work speaks for itself. I mean, I like I said, I've been following you for a long time before I ever contacted you, and and uh, you just you do some stuff that if if people can't look at it and tell that it's the next level, then I I feel sorry for them because it's it's pretty clear to me. But well, anyway. I appreciate you. All I right.
Well, thank you for being on. Pleasure to talk to you. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we both get more out of it now. So. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what it's all about. So yeah. see you soon. All right, man. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> We'll see you next week for another episode of Adult Onset Horsemanship. I've been your host, Daniel Dolphin.